The House on Seabreeze Shore Uplifting Women's Fiction Five Island Cove, Book Five Written by Jesse Newton Narrated by Jill Smith Chapter 14 Robin listened to Laurel and Alice chatter like chickens as the ferry cut through the water separating Diamond Island from Bell. She had a dozen emails to respond to, and just as many texts that needed answering. The pressure she felt bearing down on her brought tears to her eyes. But Robin didn't have time for tears. She could respond to her brides, her suppliers, and the managers at venues, restaurants, and floral shops. Once that was finished, Robin would be able to focus on her friends. Kelly needed help with the house, and while she hadn't texted anyone about coming to help, Robin had seen her face at lunch on Wednesday. So Robin had texted around, and she'd managed to get everyone except AJ and Kristen on their way to Bell Island that morning. Eloise had stayed the night with Kelly on Pearl Island, and Aaron would bring the girls to the house on Seabree Shore that evening. Gratitude filled Robin for her friends and relationships. Duke had gone out fishing that morning, the same as always, and she missed him. She was tired of passing in the night, and she wondered if she should sail up to Alaska with him and then fly home. You can't afford that, she thought. But she needed to do something to solidify her relationship with Duke. She needed to make sure her girls knew she had time for them, despite the events that dominated her life. She wanted to be there for her friends, something that had always been extremely important to Robin. AJ says Matt is on his way to Rocky Ridge, Alice said, and Robin looked up from her emails. He's gone with his father to look at the course there. I thought it was closed, Robin said, years ago. Only two or three, Alice said. They're thinking of buying it. Kristen is there with her, right? Robin asked. Yep, and Kristen says they're doing good. I haven't had time to go visit her, Robin said. I feel bad. You've been busy, Laurel said. Don't feel bad. I stopped by yesterday because I was in the neighborhood. AJ looked good, and Kristen was in good spirits. Jean had brought over some iced banana bread, and they had their cards out on the table. She smiled, and Robin nodded. She was planning to make orange rolls tomorrow morning. Her mother loved them, and she was coming to dinner at Robin's house. It wouldn't take much more time to make an extra pan and drop them by for AJ and Kristen. She missed hearing their voices and seeing their faces, and something squeezed in her chest that she knew wouldn't go away until she showed up with something delicious in her hands and could alleviate the pressure. The ferry started to slow, and Robin returned her focus to her phone. A couple of more emails got answered before the boat docked and she tucked away her device. She was going to scrub, sand, and saw anything Kelly needed her to, and she wasn't going to think about work. It was Saturday, for crying out loud, and Robin didn't have to work seven days a week. The wind kicked up as she followed Alice off the ferry. The first drops of rain splattered the sidewalk as they left the station, and Laurel said, Good thing Eloise is picking us up. But Eloise's car wasn't waiting at the curb, and the three of them retreated to the rideshare line because it was covered. I'll call her, Alice said after five minutes of standing in the wind and rain. She said she'd be here, Robin said. She knew which ferry we were coming in on. L, Alice said. We're here. Are you close? She cocked her head and listened, and then said, We can get a ride. Don't leave. She forgot. Laurel said, and Alice nodded. She finished the call and said, She and Kelly got busy looking at something online and they lost track of time. It's fine, Robin said, though the plan had been disrupted. She told herself this wasn't a wedding. It didn't matter if they didn't start on time. It didn't matter if the limousine wasn't waiting at the curb the moment they arrived. She shivered and looked up at the weepy sky. How long is this supposed to last? Robin had lived in Five Island Cove for her entire life. She was used to rainy Aprils and stormy Septembers. 
the skies always cleared, and there was nowhere she'd rather be in June, July, and August than on the beach with the full sun overhead. I don't know, Ella said. Looks like a few days, Laurel said, lifting her phone a couple of inches. It's supposed to get worse before it gets better. It's not a thunderstorm, right? Robin asked. She'd had quite enough of severe storms to last the rest of her life. Doesn't seem to be, Laurel said, but there's talk of a squall. That's just wind, Alice said. No, Robin argued, it's more than wind. It's wind for a long time, and we always lose power in a squall. They're microbursts, Alice said. They might be intense for a few minutes, but then they're over. As if trying to prove a point, the wind gusted again, causing a couple of people to murmur as their umbrellas got tugged on and they had to steady themselves. By the time Robin got in a car with Alice and Laurel, she was soaked to the bone and shivering. I hope this house is warm, she said. It's not going to be, Laurel said. Eloise said there's no services, and that means no heat. They had electricity yesterday, Robin said. How is that possible if there's no heat? And if there's electricity, why can't she turn on the furnace? I don't know, Laurel said. That's all Eloise said. It'll be warmer than standing outside in the storm, Alice said. And she looked like a drowned rat, too. Robin hadn't been able to get a word out of her regarding her date with Arthur, as Alice said she'd rather tell everyone at once than have to repeat it six times. The short ride gave Robin very little rest, though she did close her eyes and let her body simply move with the car. She needed moments like that to find her center and remind herself that it was okay to stop and breathe. The car slowed and she opened her eyes. The house sat on her side of the car and she easily peered through the water-spattered window at it. It was just as she remembered, though she hadn't come here often as a youth. It rose for two formidable stories, the exterior a bright and airy white that could use some refreshment. The front porch held pillars that looked like they'd come from an expensive coliseum, and she remembered Kelly detailing how her father had made them. He mostly worked with glass, and he'd been very talented in that regard. But he did other types of sculpture, too. The house had shiny, stained glass windows in the couple she could just make out under the eaves, as well as in one of the bedroom windows upstairs. All of the glass looked wavy, like it had been hand-poured by someone who wanted their touch in every aspect of the house. She got out of the car while Alice paid the driver, and she looked at the carport where Eloise's SUV sat. Two vehicles could be parked there, but Kelly didn't have one. A lot of people in the cove didn't own cars, as the spots to ferry them from island to island were rare and expensive. There were large lots at the ferry station and an extensive rideshare system that was almost as inexpensive as riding the bus. Come on, Alice said. We can't stand here in the rain. She hurried toward the carport with Laurel in pursuit. Robin moved a little slower, though she hated the feel of rain on her skin. She was already wet, and it wasn't going to matter if she stayed outside for a few more seconds. Alice beat her up the steps to open the door, and the scent of warm peaches mixed with something slightly chemical met Robin's nose. She ran her hands through her hair, slicking it back, before she followed Laurel into the house. General exclamations of welcome met her ears as Robin peeled off her coat and hung it from the doorknob. Kelly had no coat rack or hooks by the back door, and as Robin took in the kitchen, she realized such a detail would definitely come later. The kitchen held no furniture as it expanded from one side of the house to the other, leaving space for a dining room table and perhaps even a portable island. Robin's organizational and interior design mind started firing, and she had to rein it back so she wouldn't say something insensitive to Kelly. For Robin knew exactly why the house felt empty and bare. It was. Kelly had no money to furnish it. She hadn't the means to buy bookshelves she'd fill with pictures of Parker and baseball trophies and little knickknacks that testified of her personality. 
she didn't have extra dollars to spend to put art on the walls, or even homey touches like a welcome sign or all the home decor Robin saw in the high-end homes. She didn't live here either, and that also added to the somewhat abandoned feel the house gave off. What are you doing here? Kelly asked, stepping into Robin. You're all soaking wet. Eloise forgot to come get us. I did, she said, and she didn't sound too apologetic about it. She gave Robin a smile, too. I kept the secret. Surprise, Kelly. They all came to help. Kelly's green eyes welled with tears, and she turned away from Robin as if she could hide her emotions from anyone. Her hands trembled in tandem with her chin as she said, Thank you for coming. There's not a ton to do, actually. Eloise and I have been working on the floors in the main area out front. Other than that, it just needs to be cleaned from top to bottom and then furnished. She reached for a lockbox Robin hadn't noticed. Her breath stuck in her lungs. Everything spun for a few moments. We found this under the floorboards, Kelly said, turning to face the group with the metal box in her hands. I've been pinching pennies for months, trying to put together enough money to get things situated here so Parker and I can move in before school starts again in the fall. That's months from now, Alice said. Do you see any furniture here? Kelly asked, her bright eyes turning sharp for a moment. It was going to take that long to have the money I needed. Was? Laurel asked, because she always heard the nuances in conversation that other people missed. This box had $77,000 in it. She surveyed the group while the rest of them simply stood there and looked at her. Finally, Alice asked, Does it belong to you, though? That's a good question. Eloise said, stepping to Kelly's side and linking her arm with Kelly's. We don't know. Her father's lost, never-been-read will was at the bottom of the box. My goodness! Robin covered her mouth with one hand and stared at the pair of them. What did it say? We didn't read it, Eloise said. Robin, you texted me just after we found it, and I managed to convince Kelly to wait until today because I knew you'd be here. We should call AJ and Kristen, Kelly said. They'll want to hear the news too. It probably all goes to your mom, right? Laurel asked. I don't know, Kelly said. They were divorced when my dad died. He'd left the house years before. Mom, too. I'm not sure why he left this here. Perhaps he forgot about it, Alice said. When's the last time you forgot about $77,000? Robin asked. She practically salivated for that kind of money, and she peered into the box as Kelly opened it. Stacks and stacks of bills sat there, along with a manila folder that couldn't be holding more than a few sheets of paper. My goodness, she said again. Behind her, the door flew open as the wind rushed in. All of the women standing in the kitchen cried out. A loud clap of thunder drowned out their voices, and the light in the room dimmed even more. Help me close this, Eloise yelled, the wind singing as it soared through the narrow doorway. She left Kelly's side to wrestle with the door, and Robin took a couple of quick steps to help her. Her adrenaline pumping, she managed to help Eloise get the door closed. They locked it, tugging on the doorknob to make sure it was latched properly and wouldn't be opening again, and turned back to the group. Tension rode in the air, and Kelly said, Let's go into the living room. Robin thought she might have some chairs there, but she was wrong. This room was just as bare and just as lifeless as the one on the other side of the wall from it. The floor was a mixture of light and dark brown, and in her opinion, yes, it could be refinished. We've been working over here. Kelly set the box on the steps and moved into the other half of the house. It wasn't quite half, as the foyer bled into the living room on the right-hand side of the front door, and the wide, immaculate staircase went up. A bathroom sat behind and opposite the staircase, and Robin suspected that would be the safest place for them in this storm. Oh, this is beautiful, Cal. Alice stood in the wide entrance to the room 
and Robin joined her to take in the space. The floor here had been refinished with a dark, beautiful stain that brought out the grain in the wood. It looked brand new and perfect, like somewhere anyone would want to lay down a rug and put in a cozy chair so they could sit and read for a while. If the sun had been shining, the large, stained-glass window with Kelly's childhood surname in colored blocks would send blitzes of light everywhere. I only watched about six online videos, Kelly said, the pride in her voice not hard to find. This is what we've been working on. It's almost done. Where did you find the box? Laurel asked. Over in that corner. Kelly pointed to the front far corner of the room, and Robin could admit she wanted to tiptoe over there and see if anything else had been left behind in the recesses of the house. She didn't, because the stain here was obviously wet. The scent of it filled Robin's nose and throat to the point that she coughed. Let's maybe go upstairs, Kelly said. There's an old bed in my room. Or we can go in the room underneath the stairs here. There's a beanbag there. An old bed and a beanbag sounded like adequate furniture for 15-year-olds, but not five women in their mid-forties. Laurel was a decade younger than the rest of them, but Robin was sure she didn't lounge around on a bright pink beanbag in the evenings. Kelly picked up the box and bypassed the stairs, opting for the small room under the stairs, just across from the bathroom. AJ and I would sit in here and eat popcorn, she said the nostalgia thick in her voice. I have a few bags in the kitchen if anyone wants some. Robin waited for everyone to file into the room, and then she squeezed herself in too. I'll leave the door open, she said, noting that Alice and Eloise had taken up the spots on the beanbag. Laurel slid to the ground and sat with her knees up in front of her, her back pressed into the wall behind her. Kelly stood and Robin decided she could probably get off the floor if she went down. She sat with her back against the open door, letting some of the cooler air into the room. The hum of air blowing filled the house, and Robin asked, Is the furnace on, Kel? Yeah, she said. We can adjust it if it gets too hot. So you must have electricity, she said, glancing toward Alice and then Laurel. I hooked up a construction-only line earlier this week, Kelly said so there was no connection fee, and it's a lower rate. It only comes on when I call them and tell them I'll be here. Oh, that's smart, Robin said. Glad this place had heat. She wasn't sure how cold it could get inside an abandoned house, but she suspected pretty cold. The roof overhead rattled with the wind, and Kelly bent to set the box on the floor. Let's see what it says, should we? Are you nervous? Alice asked. A little, Kelly admitted. Wills have no expiration date, she said, adopting her lawyer voice. Whatever that will says, it's a legal document. Kelly hesitated. So if it says he left the glassworks and house to Zach... Alice swallowed and shrugged. I don't know, Kelly. Joel owned the glassworks, she said. Kristen signed the title over to me last year, how can someone else get it just because there's now a will? Alice glanced around the group. That would be something we'd take to the probate judge, she said. Your dad's lawyer didn't have a copy of the will? My mother said he didn't have a will at all. There was no lawyer. Alice frowned. But the lawyer would know that wasn't true. Do you keep copies of wills for your clients? Eloise asked. Yes, Alice said simply. It's just a copy, but it's fully executed if signed by the person. I have them in my client files in my office. Do you know when each of your clients passes away? Laurel asked, and Robin loved her keen mind. No, Alice admitted. But in Five Island Cove? I would, yes. She looked at Kelly again. I honestly don't know, Kelly. If there never was a will and the house and the glassworks passed back to the bank, that was likely done by a probate judge as well. They can't change that, but I don't know what they'll do with the emergence of a will. Kelly nodded and swallowed. She bent again to open the box, and Robin suddenly didn't want her to. Wait, 
she practically yelled. Kelly flinched and pulled her hand away from the box. What? We should call AJ and Kristen, Robin said, standing up. Her heart beat furiously in her chest, and she simply needed another minute to get her head on straight and be ready for whatever that folder contained. I'll call them, she said, tapping on her phone. She dialed AJ because she'd have better service and more minutes. The line rang and rang and rang. Then it dropped. That's weird, Robin said. She dialed again, and this time her phone struggled to even connect the call. I'll try Kristen, Alice said, and she got the line going and on speaker. It rang and rang, and then finally Kristen said, Hello, dear. Alice smiled and said, Kelly found her father's will and we're going to read it together. Can you get near to AJ so she can hear? Give me a minute, Kristen said, and it sounded like scraping and then labored breathing over the line. My goodness, his will. How is Kelly? She's on speaker, Alice said, glancing at Kelly. We're all on speaker. Me, Aloise, Robin, Kelly, and Laurel. Just a minute, Kristen said. Let me see if AJ is awake. Oh, the poor thing had a terrible night. Chapter 15 AJ heard the bedroom door squeak open, but she didn't turn toward the sound. Perhaps Kristen would leave if AJ held very still. She gripped her phone in her hand, letting the edges of the plastic case lean into her skin. She didn't care about the slight pain. She also didn't care about some defunct golf course out on Rocky Ridge. Matt and his father had gone out there this morning to look at it, as apparently the owner had finally listed it for sale. Yancey Hymas, Matt's dad, had tried to buy it when it had first closed a little over three years ago now. The owner hadn't been interested. AJ wasn't interested in her husband working out on the farthest North Island. It was a long ferry ride. She didn't want to live out on the outer islands for the same reason. To top all of that, they'd gone today, the worst day this year to go. The storm raged outside the window AJ could look out without moving a muscle. Rain had been pounding the glass for an hour, and she'd lost contact with Matt that long ago, too. AJ, dear, Kristen said, coming round the end of the bed. She didn't have time to close her eyes and feign sleep, so she lifted her head. Yeah? It's Alice and the girls. They found Kelly's father's will, and they thought we might like to hear it. AJ pushed herself up, the struggle mighty. Yes, she said, some measure of blood moving through her again. Excitement was what it was. Finally, something to care about and listen to that wasn't a television show, Kristen reading a fantasy novel to her, or worrying about Matt. Kristen smiled and perched on the edge of the recliner that faced the bed on a diagonal. We're here, she said, and she then peered at her phone and tapped a button. In this box, Kelly said, and AJ hated missing out on things. Robin had texted to say they were all going to Bell that morning to help Kelly, and AJ had wanted nothing more than to go too. She'd wanted to attend lunch on Wednesday as well, but she hadn't been able to. She told herself her baby was worth missing out on a few lunches. She told herself Kelly would understand that AJ couldn't be there, but that if she could, she would. It's just a few sheets, Kelly said. It lists my mother as the beneficiary, as the financial power of attorney, and the health care power of attorney. So it's a poor over will, Alice said, her voice very authoritative. Those are the best kind, because all the assets just pour from one spouse to the other. So your mother owns all of this. A.J. frowned but she didn't say anything. Kelly had bought the house from the bank, not from her mom. What would Paula Watkins do if she learned she owned the house and the glassworks again? 
Could the bank really take anything back from Kelly without reimbursing her? Are the titles there? Kristen asked. I have the titles, Kelly said, from when I bought the house and when you signed over the glassworks. No one said anything, and since A.J. dealt with professional athletes and their personal drama, she had no idea what Kelly could expect. Sabrina, Heather, and I are listed, she said. Equal shares, one-third each. So that's one-third of the 77000 Robin said. Or maybe one-fourth? That money probably will go to your mom, Kelly, Alice said. Money? A.J. blurted out. She found $77,000 in the box, too. Laurel said. Holy sharks, A.J. said. I already know my mom doesn't want the house, Kelly said. She might be able to hide her distress from the others, but A.J. could hear it even over the phone. Surely Sabrina and Heather don't either. Again, silence draped the conversation until A.J. wanted to yell at someone to say something, preferably Alice. Shouldn't a lawyer know what to do in this situation? A.J. reminded herself that her patience was very thin right now and she didn't need to say anything. She leaned back against her pillows and took a long, deep breath. The stress wasn't good for the baby either, and the only reason A.J. had made it through the past five days of lying around, watching TV, and pecking out a single article was because of the life inside her. She would do anything to protect it, and that included only walking from the couch to the bathroom, or the couch to her bed, or the bed to the shower. I think, Alice finally said, you'll need to show them this will. Explain how you purchased the house and glassworks, when you did that, and for how much. See what everyone says. A.J. waited for Kelly to say something, but she suspected she wouldn't. A.J. knew, though, that Kelly's sisters had wanted to leave the cove as much as or more than Kelly had. Neither of them had returned to the cove for longer than absolutely necessary, and Kelly didn't speak to either of them very often. I don't really talk to my sisters, Kelly said. It might be time, Eloise said, just like it was time for all of us to reunite, to come home. Look at us now. She spoke in a kind voice, which made it impossible to be annoyed with her. Yet, A.J. still very nearly rolled her eyes. Boy, she was in a bad mood today. Just another reason to keep your mouth shut. She said, let Kelly reason it out. She doesn't need you to rescue her. So much of A.J.'s life had been dedicated to rescuing people. There had always been Kelly, who'd always been less sure of herself than A.J. was, always fading into the background while A.J. enjoyed stepping forward into the spotlight, always clamming up when A.J. would speak out. A.J. had also protected her younger sister, Amelia. After their mother had left, A.J. had felt the weight of being that protector keenly, and she'd done everything she could to make life easier for Amy. They'd just started to rekindle their friendship, relationship, and sisterhood after the tsunami, and A.J. looked at her own phone. Amy had texted ten minutes ago to say she couldn't get off Pearl Island that day due to the storms, and she'd bring A.J. the freezer meal she'd made just as soon as she could. She'd been looking forward to her sister's visit, and having it canceled had definitely added to her sour mood. That's all, Kelly said. No big surprises. I guess I just have to figure out what to do with it now. I can help, Alice promised. I can't pay you, Alice. Kelly's regret laced through every letter. No need, Alice said. You're like a sister to me, Cal. Let me help if I can. A.J. smiled at Kristen, who likewise had been mostly silent. There's something else here, Kelly said. It looks like a list of names. Silence came through the line again, and A.J. hated with the power of the sun that she wasn't there to see what was happening. Crinkling paper came through the line before Alice started to read. Ellen Holt. 
she said, clear confusion in her voice. Betsy Dinerstein, Sidney Tyler. A.J. sucked in a breath, and so did Alice, almost in tandem. Sidney Tyler, Robin said. Wasn't that Zach's mother? A.J. started nodding, though she wasn't in the same room as anyone. Sidney Tyler was Guy's secretary, Kristen said, as if they all didn't know. A snowball effect had been happening since last summer when Zach Watkins, claiming to be Guy's son, had followed Kelly to the cove. The man had turned out to be a fraud, not related to Kelly in any way. He thought she'd have money from Guy's estate, and he'd asked after everything in the family, from the house to the art pieces to the glassworks. Minerva Thacker, Alice read. Jill Bunton. She kept reading, but none of the names tickled anything in anyone's mind. Oh, no, Alice moaned. What? A.J. demanded at the same time as several other voices. No one said anything, and A.J. found herself straining toward Kristen's phone. She held it out, her arm almost straight, her head bowed. A.J.'s name is on this list, Alice said, her voice nothing but a haunted whisper. What? A.J. demanded. My name? Why? Ava Jane Proctor, Alice read. It's the third one from the bottom. Why? A.J. asked. What is that list? Her heart pounded in the back of her throat, and she searched every memory she had for any with Guy Watkins in them. Kelly's dad had always scared her a little bit, and that was saying something. A.J. hadn't been intimidated by anyone. Why is your name on this list? Kelly asked. These are women my dad had affairs with, A.J. She sounded hysterical and near tears. In fact, in the next moment, Kelly burst into tears. A.J. let the horrible, gut-wrenching sobs flow over her and through her and around her. Why is your name on this list? Kelly asked, her voice louder. Kelly, Eloise said. She didn't. I'm sure of it. Right, Robin said. Come sit down. Why, A.J.? Kelly yelled and A.J. pressed her eyes closed. She'd slept with a lot of boys as a teenager. Some were college boys. As far as she knew, none of them had been married, and she'd never slept with anyone over the age of 27. I didn't, she said, her voice feeble and weak. No one would believe her if she spoke like that. She cleared her throat and said, I didn't, Kelly. I didn't sleep with your dad. As strongly as she could but the emergency siren drowned out her voice, cutting through the storm and the silence as effectively as it had been designed to do. In the next moment, the call disconnected and the power went out. A.J. sat there in the black silence, gray light coming in weakly through the window behind Kristen. Somehow, in the dim light, their eyes met. I didn't, A.J. said again but she couldn't even hear herself above the siren that told everyone to seek shelter and seek it quickly. Kristen's phone buzzed with an ear-splitting sound, and A.J.'s joined it half a second later. She startled and scrambled to find her phone so she could silence the emergency broadcast. Squall's coming. Seek shelter on high ground as soon as possible. All ferries are grounded, but stations are open for sheltering. She tapped OK so the message would stop screaming at her and so it wouldn't get sent again. The warning siren continued on and on, the wail of it like a slow, shrill banshee whose voice had started to lose its ability to strike fear in the hearts of all who heard it. Not AJ's, though. She was still plenty afraid of the warning siren, especially because Matt was now stuck out on Rocky Ridge without somewhere safe to stay. Chapter 16 Don't cry, dear, Kristen said, stroking A.J.'s hair. She'd climbed into bed with the other woman a few minutes ago when A.J. had burst into sobs. 
She leaned her back against Kristen's chest now, her crying subsiding for a moment, before returning in earnest. Matt's out on Rocky Ridge, she said again, and it seemed to be the only thing A.J. was capable of speaking right now. I know. Shh. Kristen soothed her the best way she knew how. She wasn't used to hunkering down during a storm. After running the lighthouse for so many decades, Kristen was used to standing up in the control room on the top level, sending out messages and conveying information to the mayor, other major organizations like hospitals, the police station, and the National Weather Service. She'd likely have seen the squalls before anyone else, and she'd have been the one to trigger the emergency siren in the first place. Reuben had called, but Kristen had swiped the call away because she'd been on an important phone call with Alice. Finding Guy Watkins' will was a huge thing, and Kristen could only imagine what Kelly was going through. She was probably sobbing much the same way AJ was, but for an entirely different reason. Kelly didn't deal well with the unknown. It scared her. Heck, it scared most people, because she'd had to handle so much of it in her life. Kristen peered over AJ's shoulder and body to her phone on the bed. It lay next to AJ's, and they were both dark. They had no service right now, and Kristen knew the electric company shut down power to the islands whenever there was the threat of heavy wind and rain, which was exactly what a squall was. They usually only lasted for a few minutes, and Kristen whispered this to AJ as they waited. The power didn't come back on after a few minutes, and ten more passed before Kristen admitted it. Maybe it's a squall line, she said, really wishing she'd picked up Reuben's call. He'd know what was going on out there, and he'd have told her where to go to stay the safest. AJ didn't respond, and Kristen began to pray silently that the squall line would be short. They could be hundreds of miles long, spanning 15 or 20 miles, and they almost always formed out in the ocean. They could bring tornado speed winds with them, and sometimes a squall transformed into a hurricane if the conditions were just right. She'd lived through several squalls in her nearly eight decades in Five Island Cove. Once, Joel had been stranded out on the claw, and he'd survived a line of squalls that had gone on for 75 minutes. The battering of the rain against the large picture window in A.J.'s bedroom increased until Kristen's brain told her it wasn't just water anymore. Hail, she said. It's a real cold front coming in. There has to be a way to get in touch with Matt, A.J. said, sitting up. I'm not going to just sit here and do nothing. She started to scoot down the bed. You're not getting out of bed, Kristen said firmly. You can do everything you need to do right there. She put her legs over the edge of the bed and stood. The light had faded to almost nothing, but Kristen had a flashlight on her phone. Do you want your computer? Yes, AJ said. Perhaps I can get an email to him or an IM. Okay, stay here. I'll be right back. Using the light on her phone, Kristen maneuvered around the shoes left on the bedroom floor and out into the living room. AJ spent all of her time in bed or on the couch, and Kristen brought her food, water, her computer, and anything else she needed. They'd watched movies played games, and sat for hours talking. The past few days had been a wonderful distraction for Kristen, and as she padded over to the desk where A.J. normally researched and wrote her articles, she said, Protect us, Lord, and protect all those women in the house on Seabreeze Shore. Chapter 17 The house sits up high enough to avoid any storm surging. Kelly said, reassuring herself as much as the others. It's the hail that we need to watch out for. The lightning. 
Laurel murmured. Her face eerily lit up from the cell phone flashlights. She had her head tipped back as she looked up at the ceiling, as if she could see the thunder and lightning through all the wood and plaster protecting them. Let's take stock, Robin said, sounding very much like one of Kelly's high school English teachers. Mrs. Robinson was forever telling her students to check everything or to make sure you have all the pieces. It's okay to double and triple check. Robin was definitely a double and triple checker, which was what made her such a great mother, a fantastic wedding and event planner, and a great friend. Let's start with the obvious, she continued. It's not going to stay warm in here forever. She surveyed the group, and she too looked otherworldly with all the blue and white light being thrown around the tiny room under the stairs. Kelly's panic reared, but at least she'd stopped crying. She'd taken the single sheet of paper from Alice to see AJ's name for herself, and it had been blurry through the tears. She'd sobered up and calmed down, but she could still see her father's handwriting. All those names printed neatly in pencil. What were they? Could they really be the women he'd had relationships with? No, she told herself, as Eloise said she had a blanket in her SUV. She never left home without it, in fact. As she got up to go retrieve the blanket, Kelly thought they could probably stay decently warm in this small room if they shut the door. There's blankets on the bed upstairs, too, she said. I'll go get them. If we stay in here and close the door and bundle up together with a couple of blankets, we should be fine. She started to leave the closet, too. Alice groaned behind her, and Kelly turned back. I'll check the food and water situation, she said. Laurel, want to come with me? Sure. Laurel got to her feet easily, something Kelly would have been able to do a decade ago, too. Now, though, she hadn't even dared to sit down on the floor. She'd taught classes back in Jersey, but that had stopped months ago. She had a mostly sedentary job now that somehow left her physically exhausted at the end of every day. She could barely feed herself and Parker before she parked herself in front of the TV or computer and stared at something mindlessly. As she went upstairs, her lone phone the only thing providing any light, she thought about how she made lists and crossed things off too. An image of those fourteen stacks of money flowed through her head. The grayish-black letters on ivory paper spelling out the will of her father from decades ago. She needed to talk to her mother. She should call Sabrina and Heather, too. They all needed to get on one call and start talking to one another again. Kelly was done not talking, and her frustration only inched up with every step she took toward the second floor. The cellular network had gone out, and Robin had said they did it purposefully. Then they could turn it back on without any issues after they'd inspected their equipment and made repairs. The electric and gas companies did the same thing on Five Island Cove, and Kelly had just forgotten. She sighed as she reached the top of the stairs, her calves burning and her lungs working hard to get the oxygen they needed. She kept her cool as she collected the blanket and two pillows from the bed in her old bedroom. She'd slept here once recently, when she'd run away from her friends. AJ had followed her, because A.J. alone knew Kelly better, almost, than Kelly knew herself. She'd said, I know the places you hide. And that was a true statement. Did I miss something? Kelly asked, her unrest and doubts churning as they grew and grew. She loved A.J. with her whole heart, and she could not imagine her very best friend in the whole world sleeping with her father but Sidney Tyler's name had been on the list. So had Ellen Holtz, and she used to live next door to Kelly's family, right there in the house Kelly would have been able to see had the squall not covered the cove in a black thunderstorm. The rain changed to hail, and Kelly jumped away from the windows. Her father had poured them all, 
adding a blue tint to the ones on the second floor to make the light cooler. He'd done some stained glass windows, something he'd perfected over the course of his career. The windows in the kitchen sported a yellow-tinted glass to make everything bright and sunny. The windows were one of the main reasons Kelly had wanted the house so badly. Her mind flashed to the memory from earlier this week of her mom standing at the fence, her new dog on a leash at her side. She'd said she didn't want the house. Any profit she might have gotten from it would have gone to her, and she hadn't died yet. Sabrina and Heather shouldn't have any claim to it. It was the cash that haunted Kelly. Her mother could use it as much as Kelly could. No, she hadn't lost almost everything she owned in the tsunami, but she didn't have much. She worked at a grocery store and managed to pay for the little two-bedroom house on the west side of Bell Island. Truth be told, Kelly had no idea what $77,000 would mean to her. She quickly split that money four ways. Enough for her, her sisters, and her mother, and arrived at almost twenty grand. She could buy a couple of beds, a couch, and a dining set with that much. With much less than that. Her hopes returning, Kelly left the room and pulled the door closed. The more protected she could keep the interior of the house, the better off they'd be. If the windows got smashed in, for example, with the door closed, the chill and the water would be contained in the bedroom. I can't afford new windows and to clean up water damage, she muttered as she headed for the steps. Worry consumed her again, and she nearly tripped over her own feet. She flung her hand out and grabbed onto the railing, feeling it give beneath her grip. She cried out, stumbling down a couple of steps as she desperately tried to catch herself without breaking anything. Her tailbone hit the wood. Pain shot up her back and down her legs. She came to a stop finally, breathing hard and holding onto a railing that swayed. It had stayed connected to the wall at the bottom of the steps, but not the top. She sat about halfway down, and Alice called, Kelly? Her footsteps approached and she shone her light up the steps. I'm okay, Kelly said. I just tripped over my own stupid feet. Her mind wouldn't stop circling, and that was the real problem. You sure? Laurel went around Alice, as she seemed to have night vision too, and came up the steps. She put her hand on Kelly's knee from a few stairs down. Yes, Kelly said, accepting the other woman's helping hand to get back to her feet. She rubbed her lower back and tailbone. I probably won't be able to walk in an hour, but right now I'm fine. She put a smile on her face, though she didn't have a happy bone in her body right now. One of her only condolences was that Parker was with her mother, and she knew no one would take better care of him than her. She thought of Shad, who'd stopped by last night and met Eloise. The squall wouldn't reach Jersey and she wondered if Julian would worry about her or his son. She pushed him out of her mind because he didn't get to take up space there anymore. He'd let her go so easily, and Kelly wanted people in her life who wouldn't. People like Alice, Robin, Eloise, and Laurel. People like Kristen and AJ. What do you think about that list? She asked Alice as she reached the foyer. I don't know. Alice said, almost under her breath. What I do know is we have microwave popcorn we can't eat without a microwave, a box of six packages of fruit snacks, eight protein shakes, ten bottles of water, and we can probably get water out of the faucets too. And half a box of pizza. That's from last night, Kelly said. Eloise suggested we bring it for lunch today. I think we'll survive for a while, Alice said. Maybe. Kelly had witnessed Alice practically waste away in front of her last summer. She hadn't been healthy, but she'd been alive. The squall shouldn't last long, Kelly said. Right, Alice agreed. But what kind of damage will they do? Laurel asked. And how long will it take to restore services? She blew out her breath, sounding plenty frustrated. I wish I had my police radio. 
Those work no matter what. Kelly wished that too. So many wishes ran through her mind that they tangled and knotted. She wished she'd never opened that lockbox. She wished she'd told her friends about the house sooner. She wished she had a better education so she could provide a better life for her son. She wished she hadn't let months go by without talking to her sisters or her mother. She wished, she wished, she wished. Dreams were made with wishes, but reality was built with action. Kelly knew this better than most, as she'd watch Julian dream big and then work harder than anyone else to achieve what he wanted. She simply needed to do the same. All right, she said when she entered the room. Laurel came in behind her and closed the door. We should be safe here, even if the windows blow in. She tossed the blanket on the beanbag, embarrassed by the dirty quality of all of it. She pushed away the inadequacy. No one could expect her to have guest beds made up and the cupboards full of food in a house she didn't live in. Let's do a tell-all, Eloise said, eliciting several groans from the others. What? I'll go first. I'm afraid my wedding dress makes me look like a great white elephant that's gone extinct. A beat of silence followed, and then Kelly burst out laughing at the same time Robin did. Stop it, Eloise said. I'm being serious. There's no such thing as white elephants, Laurel said with a grin. Alice chuckled too, and Robin still laughed full out. Yes, there are, Eloise said. I've seen myself in the mirror. Stop it, Alice said, but she still giggled. I think there are white elephants. They're the albino breed, right? She looked around the room for confirmation, but Kelly was still trying to get control of herself. She didn't know, anyway. Robin stepped over to Eloise and put her arm around her. Eloise, I've seen you in that dress, too, and you look nothing like a white elephant. She grinned at her and then around at everyone else. Alice has stuff to tell us about her date with Arthur Rice. Ooh, yes, Laurel said, picking up the blanket and fluffing up the beanbag. She sat on one end of it and added, Sit right here, Eloise. Eloise did, and Kelly noticed something pass between the two women. Laurel tucked a blanket around her right side and tossed the other half of it over Eloise. Alice gave a happy little sigh and used the support of the wall to sit down on the ground. You guys come sit here, she said. I think this blanket is big enough for all of us. Kelly wasn't particularly cold, but if the storm persisted for very long, she would be. She sat on Alice's right while Robin took the spot on her left. Eloise's blanket was bigger than the one Kelly had, and it did cover all three of them. Okay, Alice said. Arthur Rice. Another soft sigh, and Alice studied her hands in her lap. We've actually been out twice now. Twice? Robin demanded. Oh, you better start talking. And there better be a kiss, Eloise added. Eloise, Alice said in a shocked voice. After two dates? Start talking, Robin insisted. Because yes, Alice, you've been known to kiss on the very first date before. Many times. Kelly had never kissed on the first date, and she hadn't had many of those at all. She pictured Shad in her mind, and she tried once again to push against the feelings of inadequacy. If Alice had kissed Arthur already, then Kelly would be behind in her relationship. She hated these feelings, and she managed to get some of them to submerge. It's not a contest, she told herself. There's no race to win. You're not behind. She'd told herself those things before, when she'd been trying to get pregnant for the first time. This time, she convinced herself of it, and she overcame the horrible urge to compare herself, her life, and her relationships with other women's. It felt like her first major victory in a long time, and Kelly settled in to hear the story of Alice's two dates with Arthur Rice. Chapter 18 Alice's mouth wouldn't stop. 
It matched her mind, which revolved around a couple of her elderly clients, AJ, Matt, Kristen, Arthur, and then the twins. Charlie and Ginny seemed to pop into her head every other second, but she kept babbling about her date with Arthur. He took me to Renegades, Alice said. It's that brand new place out on Pearl. Anyway, the ferry ride was lovely. It was a beautiful night. Seems strange that was only two nights ago. She could practically feel the breeze pushing against her face, playing with her eyelashes. He told me about his first wife. I'd already mentioned something about Frank because the twins, my word, the twins, she gave a light laugh that very nearly turned into a sob. Robin reached over and took Alice's hand, and the silence stretched as she squeezed it. Charlie and Jenny answered the door, see? I figured Arthur is their counselor at school and they should get to meet him. Wow, Eloise said, leading with two teenagers out of the gate. Risky. Or smart, Laurel said. It's not like he didn't know you had kids. With teens, it's always risky, Alice said, smiling at Laurel. Charlie told him I'm a terrible cook. Ginny led with how I like expensive things, and he better be taking me somewhere nice. She shook her head. I swear, the conversation can go downhill in a matter of breaths. Was Renegades nice? Robin asked. Duke and I have talked about going. It was nice, Alice said, but not expensive. They're up in that castle. You know, the one that's had about a dozen different owners, and no one ever has enough money to finish it? The Blackburn Castle? Kelly asked, drawing all eyes to her. Alice forced herself to slow down, though images of AJ and Kelly as teenagers flashed through her mind. The two of them had been inseparable, and she couldn't fathom AJ ever doing something to hurt Kelly. It had always been the opposite. AJ protected Kelly. Yes, Alice said. I haven't heard it called that in a while. My sister dated the Blackburn boy, Kelly said quietly, at least until they left the cove. It's nice enough now, Alice said. They've got the restaurant open, at least. The grounds are still under construction, but I saw signs for their gardens, and they're going to have a dedicated wedding center. Wow, Robin said. That's good to know. I might need to go out there and check them out, add them to my list of venues. It's right up on top of that cliff, Alice said. The views for a wedding would be stunning. Maybe you and Arthur will get married there. Alice whipped her attention to Laurel, who wore a smile as she tilted her head back against the wall behind her. Her eyes were closed, and she didn't even crack them when Alice scoffed. I don't think so. You don't think you'll ever get married again? Kelly asked, throwing Alice's attention back across the small room. I... I've been on two dates with the man. So what? Robin asked. Some people fall in love at first sight. Just you and Duke, Alice threw back at her. No, Robin argued, though she had fallen for Duke in about as much time as it took for lightning to strike. She'd admitted it before, but Robin sometimes had a hard time sticking to her stories. She was as genuine as they came, and Alice did love her. She squeezed her hand and gently said, Yes. And look at the two of you now. Out of all of us, you're the couple that's endured, blissfully in love and working hard to support each other. Robin's eyes filled with tears, and Alice wished they could spend the afternoon beside the pool at her expansive beach house, the way they had last summer. Robin needed it, and so did Alice. The problem was, neither of them truly had the money for such luxuries this year. Robin looked away, and Alice took the opportunity to continue her story. Arthur was kind and attentive. He's smart without being overbearing. He didn't lecture me the way Frank did sometimes. She shrugged. We had a great dinner and a nice walk along the beach. I showed him where Dad and Della live, and we came back on the last ferry leaving the ridge. 
You summed up three hours in three sentences. Eloise said, you're hiding something. No, Alice said. We held hands on the beach, but every couple does that. The first time I met Aaron on the beach, his dog knocked me down. Eloise said, folding her arms. Try again. The group twittered at her comment, and Eloise's dark eyes sparkled with happiness. No. Joy. Which was so much higher than happiness. There were no dogs, thankfully, Alice said. It was a nice night. They had some tiki torches lit, and it was fiery and romantic. Is that where you kissed him? Laurel asked. No, Alice said, nudging her with her elbow. I didn't kiss him on the first date. Fast forward to date number two, Robin prompted. We went out again last night, Alice said, the whole night playing right in front of her. I may or may not have led with a kiss, so it was almost the first date. How do you lead a date with a kiss? Kelly asked. My question, too, Laurel said. You fascinate me, Alice. I've never done what you're doing. No one does what Alice does, Robin said. Don't even try. Alice simply smiled at her friends, and while she didn't normally kiss and tell, they needed something to pass the time, and she didn't mind sharing the surface details, as long as they didn't ask how she was feeling about Arthur, or if he'd said anything to her about how he felt. They'd only been out twice. She wasn't going to marry him anytime soon. Weren't the twins there? Eloise asked. Ginny was at work last night, Alice said. She should be there right now, too or she was probably on her way. She fell silent for a moment, and she actually picked up her phone to see if she had a signal. Nothing. I'm worried about them. Charlie was on his way to my house, Robin said. Jamie went out with Duke this morning. So they're alone. Alice met Robin's eye, so much teeming beneath her tongue. She hadn't told anyone about the conversation with Charlie and Ginny about the Academic Olympiad or Soraya Page. If they're together, Robin said, her eyes searching Alice's. Did you know they've talked about having sex? The question poised on the end of her tongue, but she couldn't quite get it out. Alice should have called Robin first thing after Charlie had left for work on Thursday afternoon, and every moment that passed made telling her that much harder. She was going to find out eventually, and then she'd be upset that Alice never said anything. At the same time, Alice felt like she owed it to Charlie to keep some things in confidence. She didn't have to call her BFF every time she heard some juicy piece of gossip. He was her son, and she wanted him to trust her. Robin's fingers in Alice's grew tighter and tighter until Alice winced. Sorry, Robin murmured. Go on. Charlie had a date of his own, Alice said, the words grinding through her throat. The academic team at school asked him to join them for this summer season, and he went to meet with a few of them, get to know them, that kind of thing. Ginny had come through for her brother and she'd gotten Soraya Page's phone number. Charlie had snatched it from her and hurried into his bedroom, despite Alice's protests that he not call girls in private. He'd come out ten minutes later, proclaiming that he was going over to Soraya's that night, where she'd be hanging out with a few people from the Academic Olympiad, and he was going to learn more about the team and them. Did you apologize to her? Jenny had asked. Yes, Charlie said. Thanks for helping me with that. He'd grinned at his sister, and she'd grinned back at him, nodded, and that was that. Alice loved the close relationship they had, and she wished they could be together right now. They'd be so worried about each other. Arthur arrived to pick me up, and I invited him in. I showed him the house, which I'd actually taken an hour or two to clean up, he told me where he lives, 
And then, you know how the situation just opens up and the opportunity presents itself? She glanced around, but Kelly and Laurel both looked so perplexed. We were leaving, and he reached past me to open the door, and we were so close, and our eyes met, and I just kissed him. She'd actually grabbed onto his collar with both hands and drew his face toward hers. She'd paused then, because she wanted the man to take control in that situation. Arthur had no questions asked, no hesitation. He'd cradled Alice's face in one palm while sliding the other hand along her waist, bringing her closer. Her heart had felt close to bursting by the time he touched his lips to hers, and Alice hadn't been kissed that well in a long time. Is he a better kisser than Will? Eloise asked. I'm not answering that, Alice said, a touch of sadness moving through her. I do still miss Will. You do? Robin asked, surprise in both words. Why? Memories, Alice said, shrugging. Anyway, it was a nice kiss, and then we went to a cooking class at the all-inclusive. I didn't know you could do that if you weren't staying there, Kelly said. You can in the off-season, Alice said. There's a local special through Memorial Day. Half price for local couples. The food was great, mostly because Arthur made most of it. She laughed again, chasing away some of her worries. They didn't go very far, though, and the sound died in her throat quickly. Someone else tell me about their last date, Alice said. Kelly, let's hear about Shad. Kelly's face grew warm, and she shook her head. Pass. You can't pass, Alice said, glancing at Robin for corroboration. Yes, I can, Kelly said, lifting her chin. We've been out a couple of times, too. I haven't kissed him. I like him. He's nice. The end. Awkwardness rode in the air, and Alice swallowed. She knew why. Kelly had just been thrown back in time three decades to when dating was a competition. I'm glad he's nice, Alice said with the warmest smile she could muster. I think I'm in love with Paul. Laurel said, and that elicited a gasp from Eloise and a squeal from Robin. Laurel herself grinned like a fool, and she opened her eyes to meet Alice's. I haven't told him yet or anything. Do you think he'll say it back? Alice asked. Fear crossed Laurel's face, and she blinked rapidly. I hadn't even thought of that. She switched her gaze to Robin, then Eloise. What if he doesn't say it back? Alice is always asking nonsensical questions, Eloise said, pinning Alice with a glare. Of course he's going to say it back, Laurel. I've seen the way he looks at you, and he's been in love with you for a while. Laurel nodded and swallowed. Then what? Then, Robin said gently, you ask him what he's thinking about marriage, the future, a family, you see if you two are on the same page for all of those things. If you are, then maybe you'll start talking more about marriage. She smiled pleasantly, and Alice wished she had that much charm. She had asked a harsh question, and she regretted it. Sometimes the lawyer inside her jumped the gun, and her mouth got ahead of her mind. In the silence that ensued, they breathed together. And it was nice to not be alone. Someone's phone chimed, and they all held very still for a moment. Then the chaos started. Chapter 19 Eloise was the winner. She'd gotten the text. It was from Aaron, and he said he'd used the emergency network to get a message out to her. He says he and the girls are safe at the station, they're in the basement in the jail down there. She smiled, just envisioning Billy and Grace at their father's side, behind bars. He says nothing can touch them down there. All of his cops are in and safe. He wants to know if Laurel is here, because he's with Paul, and Paul would like to know. 
Eloise looked up to Laurel, who gave her the thumbs up. He says he can only use the emergency system for a brief time, but he wanted to update us. As far as he knows, AJ and Kristen are safe. He managed to radio out to Duke, who said he was on the way back in and that he should be back by now. He said he and Jamie would shelter in the docking building, which does have a cement foundation. Praise the Lord, Robin said, the air rushing out of her lungs afterward. I'm so tired of weather causing problems. We've been hit hard this year, Kelly said, her voice low. It's only been three months since the tsunami, Robin said, wiping her eyes. I can't afford another boat. I can't even afford the one we have now. She clapped her hand over her mouth and shook her head. It's okay, Robin, Alice said softly. And Robin turned into her and let Alice put her arm around her shoulders as she wept. Eloise's heart bled for Robin and Duke. They were hit especially hard with the tsunami, with house damage as well as completely losing the Lady Hawk. As Duke's fishing boat paid their bills, it had been a devastating loss. Still, Robin was not a quitter, and she and Duke had clawed their way back from the brink of bankruptcy. She'd taken on dozens of new clients, and they'd gotten a loan for a brand new boat, which they'd named Soaring Eagle. He'd been back out on the waters within a couple of weeks, and they'd been scraping by the best they could every day since. Eloise knew the feeling. Most days, she felt one breath away from closing the cliffside inn. It took a lot of work to keep running, and she didn't have the experience with financial documents, taxes, and payroll. She'd been taking an online business class, and she'd been talking to Earl Gilroy, the manager at a bed and breakfast on Diamond Island that was about the same size as Cliffside. I'll tell him Laurel is here with us and safe. She started typing, hoping she could get the message through in time. Should I ask him about the kids? Mandy, Ginny, Charlie? Maybe he can find out where they are and if they're okay. She glanced at Robin and Alice, both of whom nodded. Eloise added that to the text, and then added that she loved him and would he please keep those pretty girls safe until she could get to them all. She smiled as she sent the message, glad when it appeared to go through. Aaron didn't answer right away, and no one spoke. She didn't want to miss a text if it came in, so she kept her phone out and in her lap. The air around her face had started to cool, and her stomach grumbled for something to eat. She said nothing, though. Four pieces of pizza and a handful of protein shakes wouldn't take them very long to consume, and she wasn't going to be the first one to eat. She'd looked through the pictures of her dress fitting again that morning, and it was like she had new eyes to see with. Suddenly, the dress wasn't right. She carried too much weight. The buttons on the back didn't lay flat. Her anxiety over marrying such a perfect man had hit a new high, and the only reason Eloise hadn't called the whole wedding off was because she'd been with Kelly. She'd been near panic when she'd looked up and out Kelly's front window to find her standing with Shad Webb on their front porch patio area. He'd grazed his hand along hers, and Kelly had bloomed to life. Eloise suspected that her ex-husband hadn't paid her much attention at all, and Shad was quite the opposite. Kelly was opposite of Alice, too, in that she didn't want to spill all the details of the relationship. Eloise had witnessed Shad giving Kelly a pretty bouquet of flowers, leaning in to whisper something in her ear, and sweeping a kiss along her temple. Then they'd separated, and he'd gone down the steps to a waiting car. Kelly had watched him go, and when she'd returned to the house, she'd hummed as she put the flowers in a vase. Where did you get those? Eloise had asked. They grow around here, she'd said, her smile as warm as the summer sun. Eloise hadn't called her on the little fib. Parker had come running downstairs, and they'd had to bustle out the door too so they could drop him off at her mother's before coming here. Let's play a game. Robin said, and while Eloise groaned inwardly, she didn't have a better idea. 
The next morning, Eloise's stomach demanded food. Now. Something. Anything. She came to full consciousness, but kept her eyes closed. The others in the room breathed in and out steadily, as if still sleeping. They'd exhausted their water bottles last night. The pizza was gone, as were the granola bars. Her mouth felt sticky and dry, and Eloise somehow needed to use the bathroom. She managed to get up from the beanbag in the pitch blackness, and since her phone had long since died, she couldn't use the flashlight to navigate to the door. Thankfully, a sliver of light peeked out from underneath it, and her eyes had adjusted enough to the darkness to be able to avoid stepping on Laurel. Laurel. They were supposed to get massages at the Cliffside Inn this afternoon, but Eloise didn't think that was going to happen. Yesterday had not gone according to anyone's plans, that was for sure. Eloise opened the door, relieved at the rush of cooler air as it hit her in the face. She drew in a deep breath and steadied herself by holding on to the door with both hands. Her head swam, and she wasn't sure if that was from lack of food or lack of sleep or both. Probably both. Leave that open, would you? Someone asked from behind her, and Eloise did what they said. She went across the hall to take care of her business, but they couldn't flush the toilet. They'd been moving water from the one upstairs to down here to do that over the course of the last 18 hours, but Eloise didn't want to make the trek upstairs to see if there was more water in the tank in the master bedroom. As she stood and studied herself in the mirror, a wisp of air started to blow across her feet. It took her sluggish mind a moment to figure out what that was, but then she said, The furnace is on. She watched her eyes widen in the mirror, realizing the nightlight in the bathroom was also illuminated. She yanked open the door and called, The furnace is on! The power is on! That got everyone moving, and Eloise wasn't the only one groaning and complaining about aches and pains. They were far too old to sleep on the floor or a beanbag, and Eloise counted herself lucky that she had a power cord for her phone in her car. She grabbed her device and headed out to the carport. The sun had barely started to come up, and there were still plenty of clouds for it to fight through. The squalls are gone, she called over her shoulder. The sun is coming up. After starting the car and plugging in her phone, Eloise waited the painful 60 seconds for it to restart. She had three messages from Aaron, and her heart warmed with every single one. I love you too, baby. I can't wait to see you again. The girls are good, and they wish you were here with us too. I'll see what I can find out about the teens. Might be hard because I don't have their numbers. Can you send them to me? I didn't get that message, she murmured, and she wished she would have. Helplessness filled her because she couldn't even imagine not knowing where her children were. And as the hours had run on, Robin and Alice had become more and more restless. Robin had left the room for a little while, and Eloise had heard her pacing upstairs. She'd wanted to go check on her, but Alice had simply shook her head. Worry ate at Eloise even now, because she knew and loved her friend's children. You must not be getting these, Aaron had said. When you do, let Alice and Robin know that I went and got their kids. They're here at the station with me. It was Harry out there, but I found out Charlie was home alone and Jenny had been driving to work when the sirens went off. She went to the nearest shelter, which was a bank. Mandy was home and I rounded them all up and I've got them. Thank you, Aaron, Eloise whispered, her love for him doubling and then tripling. In the next moment, she jumped from the car and raced inside. Aaron has the kids, she said, all of them. He went out into the storm and got them. Alice met her in the kitchen. My kids? She had her phone in her hand, but the screen was still dark. Your kids, Eloise said. He went to a bank and got Ginny, and your house and got Charlie. They're with him at the station. Alice began to cry, and she grabbed Eloise in a tight hug. Thank goodness, she said. Where's Robin? She went upstairs again. 
I think she thinks she's going to get solar power or a blessing from heaven if she uses her phone up there. Eloise smiled and dashed down the hall. Robin, Mandy is safe with Aaron. He went to your house and got her. Robin's footsteps ran toward the top of the stairs, where she stopped. He did? Yes. He sent the message last night, but I didn't get it until just now. Robin thundered down the steps. Can we call them? Let's go out to my car, Eloise said. My phone is charging out there. All five of them piled into the car, and Eloise made the call to her fiancé. My love, Aaron said, plenty of relief in his voice. There you are. I think the network stopped sending my messages. I got them this morning, Eloise said. Everyone's in the car with me. The power's back, but I think we'll try to get back to Diamond as soon as we can. I'm going to my mother's, Kelly said. Right, Eloise said, flipping the car into reverse and backing out. She slammed on the brakes. Oh, there's debris. Baby, be careful, Aaron said. All five islands were hit with hail, some as big as eggs. Eggs? Alice repeated. That's insane. Lots of reports of car damage, he said. Downed trees, power lines. If you have power, you're ahead of a lot of people. Maybe I should call my mother, Kelly said. If we have power and she doesn't... The kids are safe? Robin asked. Can we talk to them? I put them to work, Aaron said. I put everyone to work that I could. He chuckled. But they're safe, Robin, yes. You should be proud of your daughter. She helped a little boy in the middle of the night who couldn't stop crying. She pulled him right onto her lap and sang to him until he fell asleep. He won't leave her side. Robin wept again, and Eloise simply watched her. Was he alone, Aaron? He'd been riding his bike home when the storm hit. He said, I don't know what it was like for you guys, but it came out of nowhere here. It had already started to become a lightning storm by the time the sirens went off. Did you call his mother? Alice asked. Yep, Aaron said. But he was stuck here. He's only seven. Mandy was real good with him. I'm glad, Robin said. When you see her, tell her I'm on my way home. Be careful, Aaron said again. It's nasty in places out there. I love you, Eloise said. And Aaron repeated it back to her before the call ended. Okay, Cal, she said. Let's call your mom. Later that day, Eloise finally pulled up to Aaron's house. Ten hours had lapsed since she'd phoned him from the driveway of the house on Seabreeze Shore. It had taken that long to get down to Kelly's mother's house, where they picked up Paula, her boyfriend Devin, and Parker. Eloise had driven them all back to the house on Seabreeze Shore, only to have Paula refuse to go inside. In the end, the woman had no other choice, and Kelly had been in tears when Eloise and the others had piled into her car to go to the ferry station. They'd waited for a ferry for five hours. As it seemed, the entire population of Diamond Island had come to Bell the day before. Eloise had never known such frustration and boredom at the same time. She didn't dare use her phone, and she'd had it on power-saving mode all day so she could message Aaron if necessary. The man came out onto the front porch, and a sob worked its way up from Eloise's stomach. She hurried toward him at the same time he flew toward her, catching her in his arms and holding her against his strong chest. You made it, he whispered. Shh, it's okay. She cried for a moment, not even really sure why. She'd been separated from him during the tsunami, and she hadn't felt like this. They'd had radio contact, though, and she'd had his girls with her. I love you, she murmured, tilting her head back so he'd kiss her. He did, and Eloise had never felt so safe and so loved. You okay? He asked, lighting his lips down her neck. Why are you crying? He lifted his head and looked at her. Eloise should have felt foolish, but she didn't. It was perfectly okay for her to feel the way she did, and she didn't need to hide anything from Aaron. I'm just so relieved to be here, she said. It's been such a long day. Come tell us about it, he said, taking her by the hand and leading her inside. 
Move, Prince. The dog wouldn't move, and Aaron had to bully his way past the big black animal. He was left here alone, and he wasn't happy about it. Made a big mess, too. Oh, you poor thing. Eloise stopped to pat Prince and give him some love. Were you alone? Did you run out of food? He pooped in the kitchen, Aaron said over his shoulder, and none too kindly. The big brute. At least it was on the hard floor, Billy said, appearing at the end of the hallway. Eloise grinned and flew toward her. Hello, sweetie, she said, taking the teen into her arms. Are you okay? Where did you sleep? What did your dad make you do today? Oh, come on, Aaron said from the kitchen, his voice half full of teasing. She got off easy. Her job was inside. He made me organize everyone and make sure anyone under the age of 18 had a parent with ID check them out. That's the perfect job for you, Eloise said, stroking Billy's hair. That's what I said, Aaron called from the kitchen. I'm glad you're okay, Billy said, her eyes big and round. She hugged Eloise again, and Eloise held the girl tight. She tried to act brave and be brave, and she was. She did hard things. She watched out for Grace, and she was alert and attentive on the ferry when she rode alone. But she was still just a child, and all children needed love, safety, and security. And there simply hadn't been enough of that lately. I'm so glad you were with your father, Eloise said. Can you imagine being in the bank like Ginny, or riding your bike home like that little boy? He was so scared. Billy whispered. I was too, Al. We were down in the basement, and it was dark and stinky down there. There were all these bars and emergency lights, and it was creepy. Remember that next time your friends want to do something that could bust them, Aaron said. And Eloise turned toward him. Aaron, she said, chastising him. Now's not the time. He looked from her to Billy and said, Sorry, Bills. Come give me a hug. His daughter did what he asked, and he stroked her hair too, murmuring something about he was sorry she was scared. That taken care of, he looked at Eloise. How are things on Bell? We found Guy Watkins' will. She moved forward and took a seat at the table where Aaron had been putting plates. Where's Grace? Napping, Aaron said. Bills, go wake her, would you? It's getting late. Billy went to do that, and Eloise stood up again. She interrupted Aaron on his way back into the kitchen, snaking her hand along his chest. What's that look for? He asked, grinning at her. He put both hands on her waist and brought her body flush against his. You're staying the night, right? He whispered. She nodded, because she couldn't even fathom trying to get from Diamond to Sanctuary tonight. I called my mother. She's okay. Good, Aaron said, his eyes dancing with desire. Guy Watkins' will? It was hidden in the floorboards, Eloise said, quickly recounting how she'd found it and what was inside. So there's a list of names, and we need to figure out how they're connected. Oh, and you want Detective Sherman on the job. Eloise ran her fingers down the side of his face, then over his shoulder. You are the best at digging into places no one knows about, she said. You didn't like it when I dug last time. No, I didn't like you meeting Laurel in the parking lot at the grocery store in the middle of the night. She let her hand trail down his side, getting closer and closer to his waist. He seemed to know it, and he tensed. I guess you two didn't get your massages today. We rescheduled for next week, she said so she needs next Sunday off, too. You're really putting a kink in my scheduling, he whispered. Let's save the kink for somewhere else, she whispered back. If I got you the names, could you see if someone can figure out how they're related? He pressed his mouth to hers, his demanding and promising her a good time later. She won't wake up, Dad, Billy said, and Aaron pulled away as quickly as the squalls had hit. Aaron. Eloise said as he walked toward the hallway. Yes, he said over his shoulder. Get me the info and I'll see what I can do. Eloise smiled, met Billy's eye and said, 
Did you sleep at all last night? A little, she said. Grace cried quite a bit. Jenny finally got her to calm down enough to go to sleep, but she's real tired. All right, Aaron said a moment later, a sleepy Grace clinging to him and draped over his shoulder. Elle's here, Gracie Lou. Don't you want to say hello? That got the little girl to perk up, and Aaron transferred the nine-year-old from his arms to Eloise's. She took Grace to the table and sat down, cradling the girl in her lap. Tell me where you were when the sirens went off. She said, Dad had just brought us home from getting groceries, Grace said. We hurried and put the stuff in the fridge and freezer, and then we ran to the station. Eloise watched Aaron smile at his daughter. Mm-hmm, she said. Were you afraid? A little, Grace said, looking up at Eloise. Were you? Yes, Eloise said truthfully, a smile quickly following. But I was with my friends, and that made it better. Chapter 20 Kelly stepped backward up the stairs, dragging the beanbag with her. Devin was on the other side, pushing. Together, they managed to get it into her old bedroom, where Devin had replaced the twin mattress, too. Her mother had remade the bed and pushed it against the wall. It's like a couch she said, and she and Parker climbed onto it. Devin sank onto the end, panting, and Kelly knew exactly how he felt. She thought of the money in the lockbox under the kitchen sink and how she could buy a real couch with it. She didn't want to tell her mom about the box in front of Parker or Devin, and a naughty part of her mind wondered if she had to tell anyone at all. Of course you do, she told herself as she surveyed the three of them. Her mother had almost had a nervous breakdown walking into the house. She'd put up a fuss, nearly bursting into tears. In the end, Devin had been the one to get her to come inside, and Kelly had taken her through each of the rooms, showing her there was nothing left here. She sat down in the beanbag. Hopefully the power won't be out for too much longer at your place, she said. Can we get something to eat? Parker asked. I'll call for some of those breakfast burritos, she said, smiling at her son. Does that sound good? Yeah, he said, his smile wide and beautiful. He had her reddish hair, and she loved the way it haloed his head in light. Mom? She lifted her phone, which had charged a little bit in the hour since the power had returned to the house here on Seabreeze Shore. I like the sausage gravy ones, she said, her eyes trained out the window. Kelly wasn't sure if she was looking at it or through it. A haunted quality rode her expression, and Kelly wished she could erase it. None of them had much to talk about, and once Kelly had ordered four burritos, she looked at the three people on the bed. I started seeing someone, she said. Her mother tore her eyes from the window, her eyebrows high. Who is it? His name is Shad Webb, Kelly said sliding her eyes to Parker's. He should know who Shad was. He lives next door to us in the twin home. I've met him then, her mother said. Kelly nodded. When we moved in, yes. He's a little older than me, and we've been out a couple of times now. Devin grinned at her, nodding. That's great, Kelly. Her mother didn't say so, and Parker said nothing. Kelly looked at him willing him to look at her. When he finally did, she asked, Do you know what that means, bud? Seeing someone? Going out with him? It means he's your boyfriend, Parker said. Kelly smiled and gave a little shrug. Kind of. I'm not sure if we're to that status yet. We're getting to know each other. See if we like each other. What about Dad? Parker asked. Dad and I aren't together anymore. Kelly said, and it wasn't the first time she'd used those words. Her mother put her arm around Parker's shoulders and kissed the top of his head. He'll always be your dad, she told him, but he doesn't live with your mom and you anymore, and he might be seeing someone else too. Your mom isn't doing anything wrong. Her mother's eyes told a different story. 
and Kelly wasn't sure how long she could last in this bedroom. It was bigger than the room under the stairs where she'd spent the night with her friends, but only marginally. Her mother's persona seemed to fill all the empty spaces, and Kelly could practically taste the displeasure on the air. The doorbell rang, and she jumped to her feet. I'll get the burritos. I'll come help. Her mother followed her downstairs, and Kelly already had the front door open to collect the food by the time she arrived. She turned and brushed by her, her heartbeat scampering through her veins. I have some paper plates, she said, heading for the kitchen. She set the white paper bag of food on the counter and bent to open the cupboard under the sink. She didn't keep the paper plates down there, but pulled out the lockbox. Mom, she said, turning as her mother entered the room. I found this under the floorboards. Her mother stilled. Her face went white in a single breath. What is that? She pressed one hand to her pulse as if preparing to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. It's a lockbox, Kelly said, watching her for every tiny movement. You don't recognize it? It's your dad's, she said. He kept money in it when he'd travel for shows. We always had to have the highest security at the hotels. A safe in the room if he could get it. She sucked at the air, her eyes growing wider. I haven't seen it in years and years. It has money in it, Kelly said, and his will. He left everything to you. The house, all the assets, the I don't want it. Her mom said, before Kelly could even finish her sentence, you keep it. You found it in the house you legally bought. Keep it. She turned away, her movement sure and strong. Her stride told Kelly the conversation was over, but Kelly needed to know more. Mom, she said, putting the box down and following her. Wait a second, wait. She jogged after her and barely caught her before she started up the steps again. Don't you even want to know how much there is? We could split it four ways, me, you, Sabrina, and Heather. It's a lot of money. Her mom brushed tears from her eyes. No, dear, I don't want it. She drew in a breath and straightened her shoulders. You have no idea what I've done to recover from what happened. I cannot take even one step backward. I won't. Taking your father's money would be a leap backward, and I can't do it. Is that why you couldn't come in the house? The house is yours, she said quietly. It just has too many memories, Kelly said. Her mom nodded. Some good, but a lot of bad. I tried to protect you girls from so much. I really did. Lord knows I did. Tears slipped down her face, and Kelly grabbed onto her and hugged her. You did, Mom. I didn't even know things were bad until Dad lost the glassworks. Good, her mom said, sobbing into her shoulder. But they were bad long before that. Kelly thought of the eleven names on the list in the folder. What made them bad? Other women? A lot of other women, her mother said. My own inability to provide for three girls. My permissiveness. So much of my own weakness exists here. I hated who I was when I lived here, and I have worked and worked to become someone else. I'm sorry, Kelly said. We can go. Let's just take our burritos to your house. It can't be that cold. The sunshine had arrived, albeit weekly. I'll call a rideshare right now. What's your twin home like? Her mom asked. Maybe we could get a ferry there. Robin says the ferry station is jam-packed, Kelly said. But I could call Shad and find out what things are like at the twin home. I know that's where he was yesterday when everything went black. Her mom nodded and turned back toward the kitchen. I'll take up the food while you call. She stepped away and then turned back, her eyes searching and scared. You don't think it's too soon to be dating, do you? Kelly didn't know what to say. A seed of doubt planted itself in her mind, but she uprooted it and threw it away. He's so good to me already, Mom, she said quietly. I'm not even sure I knew how that felt. Her mom pressed her lips together and nodded. 
Okay. I just worry about you. You don't need to worry about me, Kelly said. I'm becoming someone different than I used to be, too. Her mom reached out and cradled her face in one hand. You sure are, baby. You're so much stronger than me. With that, she dropped her hand and returned to the kitchen. Kelly watched from the doorway while she found the paper plates and picked up the bag of food. She didn't even look at the lockbox, but she did pause next to Kelly before she left the kitchen. Maybe ask your sisters if they want some of that money. You can split it between the three of you. Kelly nodded. You said it was from the sale of his pieces? That's where he used to keep the money, yes, her mom said, until he put it in the bank. Your father was somewhat paranoid. He liked having cash in the house in case he needed it. Why would he need it? If he saw something he wanted to buy or he needed to purchase art supplies, that sort of thing. You didn't pay bills with cash, though, right? No. Mom frowned. Nothing like that. Kelly nodded, feeling so out of the loop when it came to what life had really been like for her mother when she'd been married to Kelly's father. She waited until her mom was all the way upstairs before she pulled out her phone and texted Sabrina and Heather on the same thread. I bought the house on Seabreeze Shore years ago. I'm fixing it up for Parker and myself, and I found Dad's lockbox. It has money in it. Mom said we could split it three ways. Are you interested in that? She wasn't, and she indicated that I should ask you if you are. Let me know. Before either of her sisters could respond, Kelly dialed Shad. Kelly, he said, his voice rich and pleasant. He sounded happy to hear from her, and warmth came through the line. I was just going to call you. You were? She sagged into the wall behind her, her smile stretching across her face. Why? I've got power here, and you do too. I can see your porch light burning. I had some stuff thawed from being out of the freezer for a while, so I started to put together a homemade spaghetti meat sauce. I was hoping I could feed you and Parker today. That sounds amazing, she said with a sigh. Can I bring my mother and her boyfriend? They don't have power yet, and the house here has no food or furniture. I would love to meet your mother and her boyfriend. You met them when I moved in, Kelly reminded him. A beat of silence passed. I'm sure I don't remember because I was struck with your beauty. Kelly burst out laughing. Shad chuckled too. I've heard the fairies are a bit of a mess, he said. Maybe coming from Belle to Pearl won't be bad. I guess we'll find out, Kelly said. Plan on dinner for us, though. I don't think we'll be there by lunchtime. The sauce needs hours of time anyway, he said. And Kelly smiled into her sparsely furnished kitchen. See you then, sweetheart. Yeah, she said with a sigh. See you then. The call ended, and she clutched the phone to her chest the way she had when Henry Myers had called and asked her to the prom. She hadn't been asked out much as a teenager, and he'd called because he lived on sanctuary and his parents wouldn't let him come all the way to Bell to ask a girl on a date. She pushed away from the wall as her phone chimed. After tucking the lockbox back underneath the sink, she checked her phone. Both Heather and Sabrina had texted to say they'd be happy to split the money Kelly had found. They'd both expressed shock that she'd bought the house where they'd grown up. Kelly didn't know how to respond. She wasn't sure if the bridges between them were completely charred or not. I did buy it, she said. I'm refinishing the floors, and I hope to have some furniture soon. Parker and I will live here, and I'm hoping to make better memories for ourselves. You should both come. Bring the kids. I'd love to see you, and Parker would love to know he has cousins. Or we'll come to you. With the money in the lockbox, she could afford an airplane ticket. She sent the text and then quickly typed out another one. I love you guys. She and her sisters didn't talk about serious things very often. Tears pressed behind her eyes when Heather's message came in. I'd love to have you and Parker here whenever you can come. Kelly noted that Heather did not say she'd like to return to the cove. Her sister had disliked Five Island Cove more than Kelly, and she'd suffered more heartache here. 
I'd love to come help you move in when you do, Sabrina said. And Mom says you're seeing someone new already? Kelly shook her head, though a smile touched her lips. I'll tell you about him later. We were hit with squalls, and I've got a lot going on right now. She needed to eat, and then they needed to get to the ferry station. I love you both, too, Heather said. I love both of you, Sabrina said. Kelly looked up, marveling at how healing those words could be. She tucked her phone away and headed for the stairs. Guys, she called when she got to the top of them. Let's hurry and eat. Shad has power and he's making us dinner. This looks amazing, Shad, Paula Watkins said, and Kelly did her best to keep her smile to herself. Thank you, Shad said, his smile nothing but genuine. The introduction had gone well enough, and Shad had managed to squeeze five chairs around a table meant for two. He'd not only made the spaghetti meat sauce from scratch, but he'd put together a Caesar salad and garlic bread, too. This reminds me of my mother's cooking, Devin said, grinning. I feel like a little boy again. Shad took Kelly's plate his eyes lingering on hers for a moment. Lots or a little? He asked. He hadn't served anyone else except for Parker, and Kelly basked in the glow of his attention. A little, she said. I ate that burrito this morning. Give her a lot, Kelly's mother said, her face practically shining. She wasn't saying anything about how it was too soon for Kelly to be dating again now, she noticed. She hasn't eaten since the burrito. I've had two pieces of garlic bread, she said, reaching for a third. She wasn't even sure who she was anymore. Going out with a handsome man? Bringing her family to his place to meet them? Not for the first time in the past year, she felt like she'd entered someone else's life. But this time, it was a paradise and not a wasteland. Shad dished her a full plate of spaghetti and assured her she didn't have to eat it all. They all settled down to eat, and Kelly's mother asked, What do you do for a living, Shad? I work in the finance department for Five Island Cove, he said pleasantly. Shad is the financial director for the Cove, Kelly said. He's been doing that for a while now. Twenty-nine years, he said. I'm actually toying with the idea of retirement. Oh, really? Kelly's mother's eyebrows shot toward the ceiling. That's interesting. Kelly twisted her fork in her spaghetti, watching her mother. By interesting, she meant, how old are you? Retirement is fantastic, Devin said, covering one of Paula's hands with one of his. They exchanged a glance. I'm semi-retired. What does that mean? Shad asked kindly. Do you consult? Actually, yes, Devin said. I sold my business, but I still go in from time to time to help out, do trainings, that kind of thing. I see. Shad took a bite of his bread, his dark eyes harboring those secrets again. I don't have anything official in the works. The ride from here to Diamond gets a little tiring, is all. Do you guys ride the ferry together in the morning? Paula asked, and Kelly felt like she was watching a ping-pong tournament. Her mother would fire a question across the net, and Shad would lob the answer back. Not usually, he said, locking eyes with Kelly, but we should. How did you ask her out? Mom, Kelly said. You said this wouldn't be 20 questions, and newsflash, I'm 45 years old. Almost 46. That reminds me, her mother said, and Kelly had literally never heard her talk this much before. What kind of cake do you want for your birthday? I can put the order in at the grocery store, and we'll have a little family party at my house. Kelly glanced at Parker. What kind of cake should I get, bud? Can they do that one with chocolate on the top and bottom? Parker asked, without raspberry jelly in the middle. Kelly grinned at him, though she didn't particularly like the gel layer in between two chocolate sponges. Sure, she said, with the cream cheese frosting. I can order that, her mom said. When is your birthday? Shad asked, and he tried to be oh so casual about it. Kelly heard the interest, and she supposed she'd like him to know. The man brought her flowers just because, 
She couldn't wait to see what he'd do for her birthday. It's the first week of May, she said. May 4th. May the 4th be with you, he said, chuckling. Kelly simply blinked at him, but Parker started laughing. That's right, Mom. You have a Star Wars birthday. What? Kelly asked. It's a saying from the movies, Shad explained. You know, the Jedi all say, may the Force be with you. Well, the fans of the movies have deemed May 4th a Star Wars day. May the 4th. I see, Kelly said, smiling as she looked between Parker and Shad. I didn't think you'd be a Star Wars fan. Oh, yeah, Shad said. Grew up with that. We wanted the Millennium Falcon so bad, my brother was sure we were going to get it for Christmas. She'd heard about his brother, too, a man who lived on Sanctuary now with his wife. They'd had three kids, but they were all grown and off on their own. Theodore was younger than Shad by a few years, and he'd had a sister who died when she was only six, due to complications from multiple sclerosis. I take it you didn't get it, Kelly said. No, ma'am he said, laughing again. My father was a fisherman and we didn't have enough money. I didn't know it at the time, though. My mother told me later, after my dad had passed away. Kelly reached over and ran her fingertips up his arm. I didn't know your dad had passed. Yes, he said, looking down at his plate for a moment. About four years ago now. Mom's still doing great, though. She's on Diamond? Kelly asked and she realized she'd taken the ping-pong paddle from her mother. Yes, Shad said. Kelly fell silent because she didn't want to throw another question at him. Parker, he said, is your mother going to make you go to school tomorrow? Parker looked at her with hope in his eyes, but Kelly simply cocked one eyebrow. The boy's face fell, and Kelly laughed as she reached over and tousled his hair. Yes she said. We have to go to school tomorrow. I took two days off last week. Yes, tell me about the house, Shad said, giving her an encouraging smile. Kelly glanced at her mother, noting that she'd shut down completely. Maybe later, she said. Mom, why don't you tell Shad about the succulents you grow? He's got some in his garden he keeps killing. Her face lit up, and that got her talking for the rest of the meal. Mom loved gardening, and she loved spending time tinkering in her yard. Shad had a bit of a green thumb to go with his skills in the kitchen. By the time her mom said they better get going so Parker could get to bed, Kelly was exhausted from all the talk of hedges and fertilizers, starts and potting soil. Take your time, Mom said. We won't go back to Belle until morning. She closed the front door behind her, leaving Kelly alone with Shad. Finally. They're nice people, he said, picking up the bowl with the leftover Caesar salad. They are, Kelly agreed. She picked up her plate and stacked it on top of Parker's. Thanks for entertaining us and feeding us. She gathered all the plates and followed him the few steps into the kitchen. His house was exactly like hers, just flipped. Her kitchen sink was on the right side of the house, and his on the left. They seemed to be directly across from one another, with only the wall in between them. Kelly supposed that made sense, because all of the plumbing and electrical could be run right down the middle, and both houses fed from it. I love spending time with you, he said as she joined him at the sink. If you have to bring your family along, so be it. He gave her a glorious smile and Kelly ducked her head as she thought about kissing him. Alice had said the opportunity just presented itself, and she'd seized it. Kelly didn't even know what that opportunity looked like. Foolishness ran through her because she should. She wasn't a 16-year-old flirting with her first boyfriend. She'd been out with other boys and men, and she'd been married before. I'm going to go to the lighthouse after work tomorrow she said, just to see Jean and see how they fared in the squall. Sounds like a good idea, he said, swirling a blue sponge around in the pot that had once held the spaghetti sauce. She worked in the other sink, rinsing the dishes and setting them in the dishwasher. It was a perfectly suburban life. 
one she'd thought she'd had. But Julian never touched a dish, and he didn't even know how to make boxed macaroni and cheese for his own son. She'd never dreamed that a man would cook her dinner and then clean up afterward, too. She felt like Belle from Beauty and the Beast, except she was no beauty, and Shad was anything but beastly. If I can get her to take Parker, Kelly said, would you want to go to dinner? Absolutely. He abandoned the pot for a moment. What happened at the house, Kel? What do you mean? I mean, you shut down really fast when I asked about it, and your mom looked like I'd carved out her heart. That house doesn't have fond memories for her, Kelly said, focusing on the way the water went round and round on the plate, taking the deep red sauce with it. She didn't know I'd bought it either until a couple of days ago, last week. I've owned it for years, and I never told her. I see, he said. I'm sure you don't, she said with a sigh. My family life is very complex, Shad. It would take hours to explain it all. Good thing we have hours, he said. Not tonight, she said. I'll give you that, he said, returning to his chore. But you can start. Kelly wanted to wall off her heart, shut her mouth and go about her business. That was what Kelly always did, because then she didn't get hurt. She pushed against that idea. She needed to let someone in, and she liked this man. He'd been gentle with her and kind to her son. My dad cheated on my mom a lot, she said. In fact, I found a lockbox concealed under the floorboards, and it had a list of women's names on it. I think they might have been women he cheated with. She shook her head. I'm not sure. AJ's name was on that list, and Kelly refused to believe her best friend would do something so hurtful to her. Wow, a lockbox under the floorboards, he said. Sounds very Nancy Drew. They laughed together, and as the dishes got done and the leftovers put away, Kelly told him about the lockbox, about the glassworks, about her father and her mother and her sisters. Somehow, Shad had poured her a glass of wine and taken her out onto his back terrace. They sat in a swing, which he kept moving with his toe, and Kelly said, I'll have to show you the list. You've lived here a long time. Maybe you'll know some of the women. Maybe there's a connection between them that I'm missing. I can do that, he said. My mom might know, too. She's been here forever. Kelly finally fell silent as she looked up into the stars. The swing squeaked in the night air, and while it wasn't exactly warm, sitting next to Shad kept her toasty with nerves and anticipation, especially when he set his wine glass down and took her hand in his. I used to wish on stars when I was a little girl, she said, enjoying the feel of his fingers between hers. I bet you did, he said. What did you wish for? Ponies and bicycles, Kelly said with a giggle. As I got older, the magic in the sky seemed to bleed away. She sobered, remembering when she and AJ had gone up onto the roof at Friendship Inn, a building that Kelly hadn't seen in decades. It sort of died when I realized I couldn't fix everything with a wish and a prayer. It feels alive tonight, Shad said, gazing up into the darkness with her. He'd turned off the lights on the porch and inside, and it felt like the two of them were the only humans left in the universe. Kelly felt it throb and expand, and she nodded. It does. Shad slipped his fingers out of hers and lifted his arm so she could cuddle into his side. If she did that, though, she wouldn't be able to kiss him. She turned toward him, and his hand came to the side of her face instead of across her shoulders. I don't tell very many people about my dysfunctional family. Thank you for sharing them with me. He gave her the perfect smile, and Kelly leaned toward him. That was all the hint he needed, because he closed the distance between them and kissed her. Suddenly, the whole world felt alive with magic and power, and a buzzing energy Kelly hadn't even known existed until Shad's lips had touched hers.
Chapter 21 Alice narrowed her eyes at the pretty blonde girl who'd walked through the door behind Charlie. Ginny came after her, the three of them practically talking over one another. They went right by her office without even looking inside, and Alice wondered if the reuniting her friends were doing with their families was as anticlimactic as hers. Charlie and Ginny had been excited to see her when she'd finally walked through the door. Their first question had been about food, with the second if Soraya Page could come over so they could study for a chemistry test. Alice's suspicious nature had kicked into gear then. Hadn't Arthur called her into his office less than a week ago because Charlie had scored perfectly on his organic unit in chemistry? Would there be another test so soon? Charlie's laughter filtered back to her from the kitchen, and it only annoyed Alice. If he was going to be spending time with another girl, a very pretty, very smart girl, he should tell Mandy. What's to say he hasn't? Alice muttered to herself, shifting some papers around on her desk. She wasn't going to get any work done in here, and she might as well go meet this girl that could cause a lot of drama in her life. She couldn't even imagine telling Robin that Charlie was spending more and more time with another girl. It's not your business, she told herself as she planted both palms against the desk. Let Charlie and Mandy work out their relationship themselves. She didn't have to tell Robin anything. At the same time, Alice already felt in trouble and like she'd done something wrong for not mentioning Soraya to Robin while they'd been stuck in that tiny room underneath the stairs. She'd taken a picture of the will with her scanner app, and Alice thumbed around on her phone to get to it. She emailed it to herself, then turned to her computer. The email popped up, and she marveled at the technology she had at her fingertips these days. Law school would have been so different with laptops and apps, instant messaging and the internet. That had just barely been coming into mainstream life, and she could remember when Della had gotten the dial-up service. If Alice called home twice and got a busy signal, she knew her father or Della was on the internet. She smiled at the memories, because they seemed so sweet now. She needed to get out and see her father, as she hadn't been to Rocky Ridge for a few weeks. Besides her date with Arthur, that was, and she wasn't going to pop in for a visit to her dad and stepmom while on a first date. She downloaded the PDFs and printed them, clipping them together in order, though there were only four pages. Kelly had texted several minutes ago, which had prompted Alice to leave her mocktail on the kitchen counter and come into the office. The twins had already left to go pick up Soraya, who didn't have a car, and Alice had thought about working before they'd walked in. My mom said she doesn't want the money or the house. I talked to my sisters and we're going to split the money. Does that fulfill the will, do you think? Or do I need to show it to my mom? Do we need to go to court? Alice honestly didn't know. If no one was contesting the existence of a will, or no one had asked for the owner of it to come forth, what did it matter? Kelly didn't want to drag her mother through the murky memories of the past. They all just wanted to keep facing forward, putting one foot in front of the other, like they'd been doing for the past 30 years. Alice thought of AJ and how she'd come face to face with her mother only a few months ago. She'd said something similar, that seeing her had pushed AJ backward into a place she didn't want to go. They'd gone to dinner and tried to start a relationship again, but AJ's mom barely responded now. As far as Alice knew, AJ was going to invite her to the wedding but she'd told them at one of their Wednesday lunches that she didn't expect the great and powerful Diane Proctor to come. In truth, A.J. didn't want her mother at her wedding. Alice knew keenly the dichotomy of those feelings because she'd lived them daily with Frank. She wanted him to come to Ginny's dance concert, but at the same time, having him at the dance concert was torture. 
His presence stressed her out, and she later realized stressed the kids out too. They were all so much happier now that he couldn't walk into their lives at any moment and demand they be the type of people he wanted them to be. Life was much messier, as was the house, and Alice was blissfully happy with it. Alice read over the will again, trying to find anything out of the ordinary. She couldn't. The document was a standard, run-of-the-mill, pour-over will. The section on the power of attorney and power of health care was a paragraph long. Nothing frilly or fancy about it. The signature looked real, and Kelly had said it was her dad's handwriting. There was nothing to do with the will, but Alice carefully created a file for it, putting Kelly's name on the tab. She then tapped to open her phone's note-taking app, where she typed in all the names from the fourth sheet of paper. She could still feel the paper in her hands and see the letters in her mind's eye. Her heart jumped when her eyes landed on the third one from the bottom. Ava Jane Proctor. Poor Kelly had gone slightly crazy when Alice had read that name. AJ had vehemently denied having anything to do with Guy Watkins, and Alice couldn't believe it herself. She wouldn't believe it. The fact remained that AJ's name was on the list. Alice dealt with the law and facts, not feelings. She just needed to figure out who all of these women were and why Guy had written their names down on this list and then kept it with his will and a box full of cash. Presumably, the few sheets of paper in that box were the most important items Guy wanted to keep safe. So why that list? Mom? Charlie said. And Alice looked up from her monitor and over the screen to the doorway of the office. Hmm? Can we have some of this drink out here? It doesn't have alcohol, right? Yes, Alice said, abandoning the list and the will for now. Or rather, no, it doesn't have alcohol. You can have some. Great. He knocked twice on the doorframe and disappeared taking his wide smile with him. Alice sighed, but she followed him anyway. She watched as he got down three glasses and poured the bright pink liquid from the blender. He laughed. He ran his hands through his hair. He grinned at Ginny, but he really turned on the charm when he looked at Soraya. Alice realized with horror that she was watching her son flirt and that he was very, very good at it. No wonder all the girls liked him. Alice herself was drawn into the room by his charisma. And he said, There's a little more, Mom. I'm okay, she said, looking at Ginny and then Soraya. Oh, this is my mom, Charlie said quickly. His eyes danced with anxiety for a moment. Alice, Mom, this is Soraya Page. She's the captain of the Academic Olympiad. Nice to meet you, ma'am, Soraya said, and Alice smiled at her. You too, she meant it, but there was something a little too good about Soraya. She was too nice, too pretty, too perfect. Thanks for letting Charlie do the Olympiad, she said next. With someone like him on the science side, we're going to be really strong this year. Oh, are we doing the Olympiad? Alice asked, her gaze switching to her son. Charlie's face grew redder with each passing second. I thought I might try it, he said. It's not a pair of jeans, Alice said. You don't try them on and then discard them later if they don't fit. I know that, Mom, he said. If you join, you're committing to the whole season. Alice folded her arms and cocked her hip. I read the paper. Charlie said. Ginny looked back and forth between them, as did Soraya. Alice didn't need to make a scene or embarrass her son. Okay, she said. Tell me where to sign. I assume you two are going to be able to work out the car situation? The practices are after school, right? Yes, 
Charlie said. Jenny's going to take it to work on Mondays and Wednesdays if she's got a shift. I'll use rideshare those days to get home and just walk over to the elementary school from the high school when I'm done with practice. Hmm. If Jenny doesn't have to work, she'll rideshare home and I'll have the car to take to work and then home. You've got it figured out, sounds like. Pride swelled inside Alice. That's great, Charlie. Jenny, you're okay with all of that? Yep, she said. Mom, when can we go get my dress? We never did on Saturday because of the squall. Right. Alice sighed as she picked up her mocktail from earlier. She'd been sitting at the counter, but the teens had taken it over. She took a seat at the table and then a sip of her drink. Tomorrow? After school? When are you working? Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. She recited, we can go tomorrow. I think I have a client call at two, Alice said. We can go when you get home. If I'm done. If I'm not, we'll go when I am. Okay. Silence fell over the four of them. And Alice knew exactly what it was saying. Get out of here, Mom. Okay, she said, groaning as she stood. Oh, I slept on a twin-sized mattress with Robin last night. I'm going to go take a hot bath and go to bed. Love you, Mom, the twins chorused. She grinned at them both, bent down to kiss Jenny's head, and then paused in the kitchen to hug Charlie. Common areas of the house, please, she whispered. No bedrooms. All right, Charlie said, though Alice didn't really believe he'd take Soraya into his bedroom. Can I drive her home alone? Alice released her son and looked right into his eyes. He was such a good boy, and he wanted to do what was right. Still, he had the hormones all 16-year-old boys do, and that was what worried Alice the most. You do what you feel is right, she said, smiling as she stroked her fingers down the side of his face. Be safe, no matter what. Okay, Mom. She left them in the kitchen, and she turned on a small fan on her dresser for white noise, then lit her lemon pink grapefruit candle and set her phone to play classical music. She filled the tub with hot, steaming water and put in lilac and rosemary-scented bath salts. As she sank into the luxury of the tub, with all of her favorite scents and the soft music, Alice believed she could chase away the aches, pains and hardships of the past couple of days. When she got out of the tub, she'd call Arthur and set up another date. Then she'd study that list and make some notes to go over with Kelly when they talked at two o'clock the next afternoon. Chapter 22 Through the darkness, Laurel scanned the parking lot at the station, looking for Paul's car. He'd often said it was pretty ridiculous that he had a car at all because he could take a police vehicle home with him any time he wanted. There were simply too many cars to find his. People streamed toward the police station and away from it in steady lines. Cars jammed the lot as well as the street in both directions. Apparently, the station had been one of the bigger shelters on Diamond and there had been over 60 miners here without their parents. Aaron Sherman, of course, had put a system in place to make sure the right kids got reunited with the right parents. Laurel's guilt kicked in when she joined the stream of anxious people, and she couldn't believe so much was still going on here. She'd waited at the ferry station on Bell for hours before she'd been able to get back here. She could have swam the few miles between the islands faster, and she'd seriously considered it. But with the increased number of ferries and the still-churning waters, Laurel had settled for pacing the station every so often. Hey, Rhonda, she said breathlessly as she entered the station. People talked, phones rang, and the general buzz in the air testified that something major had happened. The lights burned white overhead, almost making Laurel flinch back. Have you seen Paul? Yeah, he took over for the chief, she nodded toward Chief Sherman's office. He's in there. Thanks. Laurel took a deep breath and started weaving past the extra tables that had been set up. The main room was already so crowded, and having extra bodies didn't help the somewhat sweaty smell that always seemed to permeate the police station. 
She arrived at the office door, which stood open. Paul wore his uniform, and he had his back turned toward the entrance. Laurel took a moment to admire his broad shoulders and trim waist, something springing up inside her she couldn't deny. Love. She was definitely in love with him. That's what I'm saying, ma'am, Paul said to the windows. If you've lost an animal, you need to come down here to file the report. Our online system is far too overwhelmed. We don't have people checking those submissions, and we won't for a while. Laurel entered the office, which was blissfully free of other people besides Paul. She closed the door behind her, meeting Paul's eyes when he swung around in surprise. An instant smile formed on his face, and he said, Yes, ma'am, as he lifted one arm to gesture her forward. She waited, though, because she didn't want him to rush through his call. She held up one hand as if to say, take your time, and she forced herself to stay back. Thank you for calling, he said. I apologize for the inconvenience. He set the phone in the cradle on the chief's desk and immediately started moving around it. Laurel. Paul. She hurried toward him then, and she'd never thought the chief's office was very big. It seemed to take a few steps to get to Paul, though he was moving toward her too. You're okay. He took her face in his hands and looked at her. Into her eyes. Down her body. You made it back. Took a while, she said, smiling at him. You playing the part of chief sure is sexy. He laughed and slid his hands along her shoulders to her waist. He held her against his chest, wrapping her in a tight hug. I was worried about you. We had no contact, and I hated that. You should have seen the chief. He wasn't happy he couldn't be in constant communication with Eloise. I bet, Laurel said. She held him tightly, too, her heartbeat starting to thump too fast. Could she tell him now? Was it even the right time? How much longer do you have to be here? I told Aaron I'd stay until eight, he said. I'm just overseeing everything out there. and We've got big signs that say we're closing up at eight. He'll be back in the morning at 6 a.m. Nothing is online? The server still isn't even up, Paul said, running his hand through her hair. We've got power and phone lines. We've got men and women. So we went old school. People have to come here to get their kids, report missing animals, missing property, or anything else that might require police attention. Who would be out stealing things in a squall? Laurel asked, stepping back. People never cease to amaze me. Paul gave her a smile that sure felt full of love. He reached for her again, this time cradling her face in one hand as he lowered his head to kiss her. Laurel sure did like kissing Paul. He was gentle with her while being hungry at the same time. He moved slow with one stroke and accelerated things in the next. She kissed him back, hoping the way she felt would come through in the action. The phone rang and he pulled away. Hold that thought, he said, his voice throaty and gruff. He reached for the phone and said, Acting Chief Paul Lee, how can I help you? Laurel pressed her lips together and then smiled, the taste of him still in her mouth. She wanted to spend the night with him, and she wanted to tell him she loved him. She wanted to talk about their future, a family, and everything else they needed to in order to advance their relationship again. Her phone chimed, and she quickly took it from her back pocket. Relief cascaded through her at her mother's text. No squall here, she'd said. Bad thunderstorms. They rang our alarm too, but we didn't lose power. So glad you're safe, sweetie. Call me when you can. Her parents lived on Nantucket now, and that island sat a bit northwest of Five Island Cove, about ten miles away. Squalls could be that wide, and one of Laurel's first texts had been to her mother. Thank you, Paul said, and he hung up again. Eight o'clock can't come fast enough. No, it can't, Laurel said. It was barely four now, but the lasting storm had kept the sky dark for an hour now. She stepped into Paul again, sliding her hands up his chest to the back of his neck. Paul, she said, her nerves firing on all cylinders. I'm in love with you.
The words left her mouth easily, and Laurel liked saying them. A giggle escaped her mouth when his eyes rounded. I've been feeling it for a while, and being away for the past couple of days without being able to talk to you, I just... I love you. I love you too, he whispered. I have for months. Laurel tipped up and pressed her mouth to his, kissing him with more passion and drive than before. She wanted him right now, and she hated that this job was going to keep him from her. He kept kissing her as he walked her backward until they reached the couch. He laid down on it, then brought her into his chest again. So what do we do now? He asked, laughing a little. He stroked her hair, and Laurel pressed her cheek to his chest. His heartbeat was strong and booming, too, his adrenaline likely as high as hers. What do you want to do? She asked. Get married? Have a family? Wait a while? There's time for things. I don't want to wait. He murmured. I want you with me all the time. In the morning, at night, whenever we can see each other. Their schedules didn't always line up, but Laurel spoke with him every day. She made it a point to find him and see him in person every day. He did the same for her. Do you want children? He asked. I sort of got the impression you didn't. Laurel took a breath and contemplated what she wanted her future to look like. She'd had plenty of time to do that in the house on Seabreeze Shore, too. I think I have a lot of fears, she said. But as I overcome each one, things change. She tilted her head back, just like with you. I couldn't imagine ever wanting to be with a man, but with you, I love being with you like this. I love holding your hand and going to dinner. I love being in your bed. Mm. He watched her for a moment, and he wore his detective eyes. What? she asked. He closed his eyes and tightened his hold on her. You never stay overnight, he said. We make love and you leave. It's when we go to your place, you make me leave. I know, she sighed, not sure how to explain. I think it's one of those defense mechanisms I need to overcome. Maybe you can try tonight, he whispered, pressing his lips to her forehead. I can come to your place when I'm done here. I can see if I can find food and we can eat. We can make love. We can shower together. He grinned, and Laurel laughed with him. That's your fantasy? She asked. Showering together? Mm, yeah, he said. Very romantic. Then maybe I can stay the night. Laurel liked all of his suggestions. Maybe, she said anyway. She shifted so she could kiss him, quickly saying, definitely, between kisses. The phone rang, and she stilled. You better get that. One more kiss, he said, moaning when she gave it to him. The line stopped ringing, but Paul didn't stop kissing her. Finally, Laurel pulled away when someone rapped on the closed door. She got to her feet quickly, as did Paul. She still wore yesterday's clothes, and she sat back on the couch as Paul straightened his uniform and opened the door. You are in here, a woman said. I've got your sister out here. Paul peered out the doorway. My sister? My sister doesn't live in the cove. She says she's your sister. He looked at Laurel. Would Julie be here? No way, Laurel said. Why fly into the belly of the beast? She stood and joined him in the doorway. The crowd had started to thin, it seemed, and she definitely didn't see Julie. I can make dinner tonight, she said, slipping her hand into his. I've got time. Then you can just come over when you're finished here. You sure? Yes. Okay, he said. He kissed her one more time, this one quick and without the passion and promise of more later. He slipped away from her, stepping out of the office and walking toward the fray of people. A woman who certainly wasn't his sister stood at the end of the row of tables. 
She looked nervous as she handed him an envelope. Just a regular white envelope, the kind Laurel had once used to pay her bills before everything moved online. She had dark brown hair that fell to her shoulders. It looked wavy, with straight-cut bangs across her forehead. She glanced toward the office, and for some reason, Laurel wanted to shrink out of the doorway. The woman's dark eyes caught hers before she could, and Laurel studied her. No freckles, definitely some Botox treatments in her lips, small chin. Standing next to Paul, the top of her head barely hit his shoulder, so she was a similar height to Laurel. She carried no extra weight on her frame, and she nodded to Laurel as if they knew one another. Laurel frowned and stepped out of the office because she didn't know this woman. She couldn't see Paul's face fully, but he lifted the envelope, and the woman turned to leave. What was that about? Laurel asked as he approached the office again. She said her name was Betsy Dinerstein, and she had some information for the chief, some case he's been working on. What case? Laurel asked, though it really wasn't any of her business what the chief did. Betsy Dinerstein tickled in her mind. She knew that name. Where did she know that name from? I don't know. Paul tossed the envelope on Aaron's desk as the phone rang again. He sighed as he sat in the desk chair. He looked regal and commanding there, and Laurel sure did enjoy the sight. I'm sorry, Laurel. Things are crazy. It's fine, she said. I knew they would be. He reached for the phone, giving the same spiel as he had before. He explained that they weren't taking property damage complaints at the police station, but that those items should go to an insurance company. It's highly unlikely that someone was out in the hailstorm hitting your car with a baseball bat, he said, rolling his eyes. You need to call your insurance company, sir. Laurel smiled encouragingly at him, and the call ended a moment later. I'll make dinner, she said. You come when you can. Yes, ma'am, he said giving her a tired smile. Sorry, Laurel, I should have told the chief I couldn't do this. Not at all, she said. You're his second. There's nowhere you should be but here. She gave him another smile, and he walked her to the door. He kissed her again, and Laurel could get lost in his touch. Paul, someone called, and he pulled away. Yep. He strode out of the office, leaving Laurel in the doorway. She turned back to Aaron's desk, that white envelope standing out to her. Betsy Dinerstein, she muttered to herself, retracing her steps to the desk. Like a flash of lightning to the brain, she realized where she'd heard the name. It had been on the list Kelly had found with her father's will, the one with AJ's name on it too. Could there be a connection between all these women? If so, what was it? Without thinking or hesitating, Laurel snatched up the envelope. She shoved it down the front of her jeans and turned to leave the office. Chapter 23 AJ watched the front of the house, aware that Kristen had been busy in the kitchen for 30 or 40 minutes. Sharp guilt almost felt the same as the labor pains she'd experienced last week, but she didn't say anything. The labor pains had been false, and the doctor had stressed that A.J. needed to take things easy. Having someone around constantly wasn't as easy for A.J. as she thought it would be. She adored Kristen, and she'd enjoyed talking to her this week. A.J. just needed a break from it all. She needed Matt to pull into the driveway, and she needed him to hold her and tell her he'd been fine, and she was fine, and they were fine. Finally, a swath of headlights cut through the deepening darkness outside, and her first inclination was to jump to her feet. She reminded herself in time that she couldn't do that, and she stayed in the recliner Kristen had positioned to face the window. A minute later, the front door opened, and Matt entered the house, a ragged look on his face and plenty of wind accompanying him. He didn't see her and A.J.'s heart bled for the man. He'd always been so good. 
good to her and good for her. Tears came to AJ's eyes, and she lifted her hand as Matt let his backpack slide to the floor. He caught sight of her then, and the instant brightness that filled his face told AJ how he felt. Ava Jane, he said, her name conveying the great love and relief he felt too. He hurried toward her, and AJ pushed herself to her feet slowly and carefully. Matt took her into his arms and held her tight, their baby a five-month-old bump between them. I'm so sorry. He said, I missed you so much. They'd been separated for a lot longer than two days before, and slight foolishness ran through AJ as she wept into his shoulder. I was okay, he said. We were taken in by some really kind people who, of course, knew Dad. The Ringwalds, AJ said, because he'd told her all of this on the phone when service had been restored earlier that day. Hmm. Matt swayed with her, the scent of him more like fish and sweat than his normal musky cologne and fresh cotton. I need to shower. I do too, she whispered. Hmm, he said again, his grip on her nowhere near softening. I think I'm going to go check on Jean and Reuben, Kristen said, and that got Matt to step away. Thank you so much, Kristen he said, turned and crossing the room to her. He engulfed her in a hug, too, and she patted him on his broad shoulders. He said something else AJ didn't catch, but she didn't need to. Kristen's smile said a lot, and she nodded. Reuben is almost here, she said. I won't be driving. You'll come back, though, right? AJ asked. Kristen looked at her. I was thinking you'd like a day or two alone. Her eyes held questions that AJ didn't know how to answer. She would, Matt said. I'm going to be working from home tomorrow. He watched AJ, and she wasn't sure what he was trying to convey. She'll be okay Tuesday, but maybe you could come get her for the weekly lunch you ladies do on Wednesday and come stay with us again for a few days after that. I can do whatever you'd like. Kristen said, I don't have much going on right now. She also didn't want to be alone. AJ had picked that up, and Kristen hadn't been too terribly subtle about it. Maybe we can start looking at some of those places online, AJ said, when you come back. Kristen smiled and nodded, moving to embrace AJ as another pair of headlights flashed in the window. You don't have to go, AJ whispered her chest suddenly tight. I know, Kristen said, and nothing more. Reuben came to the door and helped her with her bag, nodding to AJ and shaking Matt's hand. Sixty seconds later, they were gone. You were okay here, right? Matt asked, returning to her. He put his hand on the back of her elbow and guided her through the living room and into the family room past the office where they worked, and the kitchen Kristen had cleaned from top to bottom. I was fine, AJ said. It was just like when we were up at the Cliffside Inn waiting for the tsunami to hit. It's the fear of the unknown. You hate being out of contact, too, he said. Yes, I do. AJ felt somewhat crazy for her near breakdown, and she knew some of that was because she wasn't taking her medication right now. Do you want to shower with me? Matt asked, releasing her and reaching back to take off his shirt. Hmm, she answered, as that seemed to mean yes in Matt Hymas's vocabulary. AJ blinked at her phone, Matt's steady breathing in the bed next to her, soothing and something she'd missed last night. She found it strange how worry could amplify things so much. It could also cover up other things, and A.J. remembered walking along the beach once in Miami. She should have been enjoying the heat of the sun, the rush of the waves as they tried to cover the shore, the call of birds, the sound of children laughing, and memories being made. 
All she remembered was the strength of the breeze and how cold it made her skin. It had seeped right into her soul because A.J. had been so worried about her college education, where she should be headed, and how to make sure her sister got out of the cove. Now she wasn't cold, and she'd only been separated from Matt for one night. The worry had definitely made it feel much longer and much worse than that. This new text she'd gotten from Kelly felt the same way. It sent ice down into her lungs, the hooks of it tugging against A.J.'s ability to breathe. I'd like to come over in the morning, Kelly had said. When is too early for you? I have a meeting at two, so let me know. She could come any time. A.J. hadn't done any articles this week, unable to focus and seek out new leads. She and Matt hadn't combined their resources yet, but he told her she didn't need to worry about money. She was living with him, and he was fine to pay all the utilities, for groceries, for anything she needed. Since A.J. was trying to eliminate as much stress from her life as possible, she'd taken him at his word. She hadn't worked and she'd tried to nap, rest, and relax as much as possible. Any time is fine, A.J. typed out. Matt's working from home tomorrow, and Kristen's gone back to the lighthouse. That might influence Kelly's decisions, as perhaps she'd want to see Kristen, too. I'll drop Parker off at school and come over then, okay? Probably close to nine. Can't wait, A.J. said though she definitely could wait to see Kelly face to face. She'd already texted her half a dozen times, telling her she had no idea why her name would be on any list of Guy Watkinses, and that she absolutely did not sleep with him, or even get close to sleeping with him. Kelly hadn't responded until that text about coming over tomorrow. AJ exhaled and set her phone face down on her nightstand. She needed to relax, and stressing about what Kelly might or might not say in the morning wasn't the way to do it. Chapter 24 I'm home, Robin called, pure exhaustion flowing over her. Mom, Mandy yelled. She and Jamie came tearing down the hall from the living room at the back of the house. They bulldozed into Robin both of them hugging her tightly. She put her arms around them, too, her tears fresh as she embraced them. Oh, you guys, she said. I'm so glad you're all okay. She stroked Mandy's hair and leaned back. You're okay? You were here alone. I'm so sorry. It's okay, Mandy said, only for a couple of hours. Chief Sherman showed up in the middle of the lightning storm, demanding I go with him. She gave Robin a tearful smile. Now that was a scary drive. I'll bet it was. Robin saw Duke appear down the hall as he stepped out of the kitchen. Her heart squeezed because he was still the sexiest man on the planet. Her life partner. Her husband. Her lover. At least you didn't have to stay in the house alone all night, Robin said. Every time she thought about such a thing, she shivered. She turned her attention to Jamie. You were with Dad. How was it? I'll never get the smell of fish off me, Jamie said soberly. But we were safe. There were a lot of us piled into the underground where they normally store fish. Gross, Robin said with a smile. Yes, fish could stink, but fish were her and Duke's livelihood. Without fish, they wouldn't be in the cove, and they wouldn't have what they did. Come on, she said. I heard Dad found frozen pizza and that it would be ready when I got home. The three of them walked down the hall, and Mandy and Jamie peeled off as Robin stepped into Duke's arms. She didn't have to say anything. He didn't either. He simply held her as another squall raged through Robin's whole body. She tried to hold back her tears, but she failed. She shook in his arms, and he simply let her. You're all right, he whispered after a few moments. I'm all right. The girls are all right. She nodded against his shoulder, 
glad and grateful for his steadiness and strength. What about the boat? she asked. She took some damage, Duke admitted, clearing his throat. But I've already got her patched up. After I got Mandy from the station this morning, we went back to the dock to work on her. It's fine, love. Fine was not what Robin wanted to hear. Not for a brand new fishing boat that had cost them $45,000. When are you going to go out again? Tomorrow, if the storms clear a bit more. She nodded, but she didn't want him to go fishing tomorrow. She didn't want to work, scrambling around her office and moving sticky notes. She had a million phone calls to make to her beachside venues to find out what damage they'd sustained. She had an anniversary party on Wednesday that was supposed to be catered by the seafood source, and she wondered if they'd even have the food. Her task list stretched for a mile in her mind, and she worked to shut it off. Maybe you could take a day off, she said meeting her husband's eyes. She wanted him to see how very tired she was. She wanted someone to acknowledge it. She wanted someone to give her permission to take a day off. Duke, who'd always been so good at seeing what Robin needed, nodded. I will if you will. Robin put her palm against his chest. We can stay in bed all day. Mm, I like the sound of that. He put his hands on her hips and they swayed together as if dancing. He leaned down and kissed her, and Robin didn't care about pizza or planning. She just wanted to lay in this man's arms and listen to the sound of his breathing as he slept. The pizza is ready, Mandy said in a sharp tone, and Robin broke the kiss with her husband. She looked over to the girls, catching the look of disgust on Mandy's face. She actually smiled at it, because she wouldn't think it was disgusting to be kissing Charlie. I heard you got to spend the night in jail, Robin said, and that you helped a little boy. Yeah. Mandy picked up a plate and handed it to Robin as she stepped over to the island. I really like kids. I'm thinking about being a teacher or opening a daycare or something. Surprise darted through Robin. Oh? Mandy had never said anything about what she wanted to do when she finished high school. Where would you go to college? I don't know. Mandy put a piece of pizza on her plate and turned toward the table. Dad got one of those bunt cakes. I picked it out, Jamie said. I got the strawberry fields one, Mom. I know you like that one. She beamed at Robin, who put her arm around the 13-year-old's shoulders and smiled at her. I do, she said. Thanks, bug. Since Mandy had moved on to dessert so rapidly, Robin didn't think she wanted to talk about her future, college, or classes. Robin didn't want to discuss them either. She wanted to eat and go to bed, and thankfully, because she and Duke had a Sunday night routine where they did retire to their bedroom early and let the girls have the run of the house, she got her wish. Duke woke her in the morning his 4 a.m. alarm singing through the darkness. Sorry, he mumbled, rolling over to silence it. He turned back to her, retaking her into his arms. Are we really staying home today? Can we? she asked. You have an office here, he murmured, pressing his lips to her earlobe a moment later. You'll work no matter what. He was probably right, but Robin didn't admit it. She pressed into his touch and slid her hand south along his body, hoping he'd get the hint to keep kissing her. Duke had always been able to pick up on her subtle hints, and she enjoyed making love to her husband. She dozed afterward, as did he, and it wasn't until Mandy knocked lightly on the door and called, We're going to school, that Robin opened her eyes again. Light poured in the bedroom window and she sat up, Okay, she called. Have a good day. Slight guilt cut through her that she hadn't gotten up to see the girls out the door. Duke usually drove them, and she wondered who'd taken them today. They're fine, Duke said. Lay back down. I'm awake now, Robin said, twisting to look at him over her shoulder. 
He had his phone held up above his face, a frown forming between his eyebrows. What? Guess we better shower, he said, handing her the phone. Your mother is on her way over. Robin's plans for a peaceful, relaxing day went up in smoke. She read her mom's messages. Wanted to come see you for a few minutes. I'll be there in about an hour if that works. Her heart sinking to the floor. When did you get this? She asked, but she could see the timestamp right above it. Ten minutes ago. I don't want to entertain my mother today. Jennifer Golden was impossible to entertain anyway. Robin had been working on her relationship with her mom for months now, after a long drought of not trying very hard at all. Duke got out of bed and padded into the bathroom. Maybe she'll only stay for a few minutes. Maybe, Robin said, frowning just the way Duke had. Why did she text you? She switched Duke's phone for hers and saw that she had three missed calls from her mother. A great sigh filled her lungs, and she blew all the air out as Duke started the shower behind her. She hadn't bothered to clean up the kitchen last night, and she had no idea what the girls had done for breakfast or lunch this morning. She skipped showering and left Duke in the bedroom to go get the house tidied up. Her mother owned the house, and Duke and Robin paid a nominal amount in rent. The least she could do was make sure her mother knew how much she appreciated the gesture by keeping the place in good repair. Hello? Her mom called only several minutes after Robin had started doing the dishes. Not an hour. Not even close. In the kitchen, Mom, Robin called, making her voice as jovial as possible. Her footsteps came closer and Robin put the last two plates in the dishwasher. You're alive, her mom said. Robin bent to close the appliance, and then she turned toward her mom. She wore a pantsuit in navy blue, with a white top with plenty of ruffles along the neckline. Wow, you're wearing heels, Robin said. What's going on? I'm meeting with Jonas today, she said. This morning, in a little bit, and then I have a lunch date. Ooh, fancy, Robin said. A date with your lawyer, and then a date with your friends. She gave her mom a smile and crossed the distance between them to hug her. What are you meeting with Jonas about? My estate, she said, stepping back and clearing her throat. She lifted her chin slightly, and Robin stepped back, surprise already filling her. The lunch date isn't with my friends. It's with a man named Tony Rudd. Robin opened her mouth to speak, but nothing came out. We met on the cruise over Christmas, her mom said, that defensive look in her eyes blazing hot now. You'd know about him if you didn't work so much. Irritation coated Robin's mouth. All of her walls shot right back into place, too. Of course, it was her fault she didn't know every intimate detail of her mother's life. She should be calling and texting daily to find out if she had oatmeal for breakfast or raisin bran. You could have sent me a text, Robin said, folding her arms. We have a very expensive boat to pay for now, and I need to work more. Your poor girls had to call me for a ride this morning, her mom said, shaking her head. I asked Jamie what she had for breakfast, and she said she didn't eat breakfast. She's not a big breakfast eater, Robin shot back. Her mom didn't know that, because her mom preferred to dote on Robin's siblings and their children. None of them lived in the cove anymore, and they sent cards and emails, gifts and surprises. Robin lived here, and she saw her mother more than any of them. She spent time with her and made sure she knew when the girls' activities were. But she didn't send cards or continually play to her mother's ego. Her mother ignored the comment about Jamie's eating habits and said, I noticed the van is still in the garage. Is Duke not going to work today? Morning, Jennifer, he said right on cue. He glanced at Robin, noting the stiffness in her stature in less time than it took to blink. He turned back to her mother and gave her a big hug. She laughed because Duke was a big man with a big personality, and Robin's mother had always liked him. We're taking the day off 
he said, setting her down and stepping over to the coffee maker, which had no coffee. He started filling the pot. We had a rough weekend, as I'm sure you did. She was at home, Robin said through her teeth. Her mother had a built-in generator, too, so she hadn't even lost power for very long. She'd had her bed, her clothes, plenty of food, and all the comforts she normally did. Tony would like to meet you, she said, moving from one topic of conversation to another so rapidly. I was wondering when you might be available. I don't know, Robin said. I have an anniversary party on Wednesday evening and a wedding on Saturday and one on Sunday. Friday evening? Her mom asked, as if Robin just waved a magic wand and weddings planned themselves. She never made plans the night before a wedding, and this Friday was the night before a double wedding weekend. I can't Friday, Robin said. Perhaps a day during the week next week? I won't have another wedding until Eloise's after Sunday. That gave her two weeks to fit in her mother and her new boyfriend. She almost always met with clients and venues and businesses during the day, so her evenings were free. Weekends were tough for her because she did some consulting on the weekends, along with fittings, last-minute prep, email answering, and the returning of messages. A vein of tiredness ran through her, and she lifted her hand to rub her forehead. I'll see if Monday or Tuesday would work, her mom said. That should be fine, Robin said. You look tired, dear. You shouldn't work so much. Robin let her hand fall back to her side. Mom, I'm doing the best I can. She immediately regretted the sharp tone in her voice. I'm sorry. It was just a really long weekend, and I didn't get anything done I needed to. Jennifer, we're doing what we can to get back on our feet. Duke said, coming to stand beside Robin. I'm going to Alaska again this summer, and that should get us back in the clear. Robin won't work like this forever. He put his hand on her waist and drew her closer to him. She loved being his, and she leaned into his warmth and strength before facing her mom again. Her mom studied her, barely looking at Duke. You remind me of a woman I knew once, she said. She was so dedicated to her family, worked her fingers to the bone to make ends meet. I really admired her. Great, Robin said. Then you admire me too. Her mom hugged her. And Robin was as surprised by that as much as anything else. Maybe not the boyfriend, but close. Clearing her throat, her mother stepped back. I wonder what happened to Jill. They up and left the cove so fast. Jill who? Robin asked, just to be nice. Oh, you remember Jill, her mom said. But Robin clearly didn't, or she wouldn't have asked. Jill and Howard Bunton? They lived around the corner from us for a few years. You were, oh, let's see, 15 maybe. Her husband worked for Guy Watkins for a while. Then, one day, they were gone. Jill Bunton, Robin said the letters written in Guy's handwriting leaping into her mind's eye. I do remember her. Her eyes widened. Howard worked for Guy? He did all the shipping for his pieces, her mom said. Jill started working as a cleaning lady. Oh, how she cleaned. Day and night, it seemed, so they could have what they needed. The cleaning lady, Robin said, a fuzzy memory coming to her mind. I do remember her. All right, her mom said in a falsely cheery voice. I have to go. I'll talk to you later. Thanks for driving the girls, Duke said. Robin and I were busy. Duke, Robin said, horrified at what he'd just insinuated. But her mother just laughed as Duke walked her toward the front door. Jill Button, Robin said, quickly grabbing her phone and typing the name into it. The cleaning lady. If she could sneak away from Duke today, she'd do a little internet research to see what she could find out about the Buttons and what they'd done for Guy Watkins. Chapter 25 Kelly stared at the list of names by the light of her bedside lamp. The sun would rise in less than an hour, but she'd been up for at least 30 minutes. 
She'd taken another day off of work, and since she had some leeway now in her finances, she'd decided she better get some answers before she went insane. She'd scheduled to meet with Alice at two o'clock that day, simply to find out any legalities about the will she'd found, and to find out if she needed to have Heather and Sabrina sign something saying the three of them were going to split the money evenly. And then it was all done. Executed. Finished. Kelly didn't want to take more than her share, but she was willing to take the money. Heather and Sabrina seemed to be as well. Her alarm went off, and Kelly closed the folder, looking at the front cover of it. Her dad had not written anything on the front of it or the tab. The four-page will sat inside with this extra sheet of paper with a list of eleven names. No explanations for anything. Kelly sighed as she got out of bed and got in the shower. Her morning was just as hectic as always because she hadn't told Parker she wouldn't be working that day. As they pulled up to the elementary school in the rideshare, she said, Okay, remember Jean is going to pick you up this afternoon. I'm going shopping for beds and a couch. She grinned at Parker, who smiled back. Okay, in the circle drive? Right here in the circle drive, Kelly confirmed. She needed to call the bakery and have them deliver a gift basket to Jean, too. The woman had saved Kelly by taking Parker so many times, and Kelly wanted her to know how much she appreciated it. Okay. Bye, Mom. Bye, baby. Kelly watched her son get out of the car, and then she said, I need to go to 391 Lakeshore Drive, please. You got it, the woman said, putting the car in gear. The ride from school to AJ's didn't take very long, and Kelly's stomach played nicely until the cute, almost beach house came into view. Thank you, she said, swiping her rideshare pass and stepping from the car. The wind played with her hair, a reminder that it could do almost anything it wanted, and Kelly turned her face into the breeze. She walked toward the house and up the steps to the covered porch. She wasn't sure but she thought Matt Hymas had lived near here growing up. She rang the doorbell, and not three seconds later, A.J. stood there. You're supposed to be in bed, Kelly said, everything softening at the sight of her best friend. Everything A.J. told her was of course true, and all of Kelly's fears and doubts dried right up. Come on, Kelly said, stepping into the house. Where are you, the couch? A.J. closed the door, and the moment she turned toward Kelly, she took her into a hug. Neither of them said anything, which was a little surprising for A.J. Kelly was used to letting actions say more than words, and when A.J. finally released her, she wiped at her tears. Let's sit down, Kelly said, realizing A.J. had not said anything yet. You're not supposed to be up. Where's Matt? I would have just come in if I thought he wasn't going to answer. She looked into the formal living room, but he wasn't there. He's working, A.J. said. Has his headphones in. I told him you were coming. Kelly nodded and went into the family room. A blanket and pillow lay on the couch, and that was obviously where A.J. had been lying. Lay down, sweetie, Kelly said, her maternal instincts kicking in. Have you eaten? Do you need something to drink? Matt got me all set up before he went into the office, she said with a smile. She did ease herself onto the couch, and Kelly took the spot next to her. She set her oversized purse on the floor and withdrew the folder. I found this under the floorboards in my dad's office. She handed the documents to AJ. It's his will and that list. A.J.'s eyes held plenty of apprehension, but she took the folder and opened it. She scanned the will quickly, saying nothing, and then turned to the last sheet of paper. The dark beige, nearly brown color of it testified of its age, as did the nearly smudged pencil her father had written in. Betsy Dinerstein, Sidney Tyler, Ellen Holt, A.J. read, Jill Button, Minerva Thacker, Annalise Green. Her voice faded. After several long seconds, she said, 
I know Annalise Green. She's barely older than us, Cal. Remember? She was the goalkeeper on the soccer team my freshman year. She was a senior. Light bulbs lit up in her head. I do remember her. You didn't like her much because she thought you'd slept your way onto the team. AJ nodded, and Kelly was glad there wasn't any animosity between them. She reminded herself that AJ knew who she was and what she'd done in high school. She'd never been embarrassed about it until recently. Kelly marveled that she'd overcome that hurdle so fast. Everything she regretted seemed to stretch on and on and on. It took her years to overcome the things she regretted, and she often felt like she needed to seek out the person she'd behaved poorly in front of, apologize, and assure them she'd grown, changed, and hadn't ever done something so regretful since. Such a thing was hardly ever doable, though, so Kelly stewed over things she'd done until she finally let them go. There's no way on this planet Annalise Green would have slept with your dad, A.J. said. I don't think that's what this list is anymore, Kelly said. I think it's something else. What? A.J.'s eyes lingered at the bottom of the list for a moment, where her name sat. The two girls below me also played sports at the high school, she said. Brittany Larson and Camila Cho. A.J. looked up a faraway look on her face. Brittany was a year older than us. She played basketball. Camilla was a year younger. She played tennis. By the time she finished talking, A.J.'s voice was almost a whisper. I don't understand it, Kelly said. A.J. shook her head. I don't either, Kel. Here's the real question. She closed the folder and placed her hands over it. Does it matter? Does it matter if you know who these people are to your father? He's been dead for a long time. Kelly didn't know how to answer that. It feels like I need to know right now. She'd felt the same way about Zach Watkins, and that whole situation had turned out terribly. Maybe I'm searching for something I'll never find. Maybe, A.J. said instead of contradicting her. She sighed and looked down at the folder. In the next moment, she pulled in a breath. Kelly, have you seen this? AJ gripped the edge of the folder. What? Kelly leaned forward, but she didn't have to look far. AJ had closed the folder so the back was facing up, not the front. There's writing here. She tilted the folder, as it looked like it had been erased or had faded so much the letters were barely legible. A.J. lifted the folder closer to her face. It says, Tell Joel, get glassworks back. Kelly sucked in a breath and reached for the folder. She didn't mean to pluck it from A.J.'s grip in a somewhat violent manner, but she was afraid she had. She, too, peered at the letters, the imprints of them right there at the top of the folder, nearly impossible to see. She tilted the folder and the light caught the graphite, making them much easier for her eye to make out. Tell Joel? She repeated, her voice going up as her dad had written it as a question. Get glassworks back. That last sentence was not a question, and Kelly didn't know what to make of it. This folder could have been used for anything, she said, lowering it to her lap. It wasn't marked at all. What did he tell Joel to try to get the glassworks back? A.J. asked. We know Joel bought it out from under him. Kelly's mind spun, because yes, she did know that now. That news had come out almost a year ago, after Joel Shields had died and left all of his papers behind. Kristen had signed the glassworks back over to Kelly, but she'd done nothing with the land or building yet. She honestly didn't know what to do with them. She wasn't a glassblower or artist. She'd simply wanted them to keep them in her family. Her father had been so talented, and she had so many good memories at the building where he'd completed so many great art pieces. Let me call Alice, Kelly said. Maybe she can come here for our meeting at two. Oh, you're meeting with Alice? A.J. asked. Kelly nodded, 
her focus on her phone. Yes, she's looking at some of the legal aspects of the will for me. I also need to call my sister again. Do you care if I hang out here with you? She looked up at AJ, whose bottom lips started to tremble. I'd love that, Cal, AJ whispered. Thank you for believing me. Of course I believe you, Kelly said, abandoning her phone and leaning over to give AJ a hug. I know I'm crazy. It might hurt to know what this list is, but I feel like right now I need to know. Then I'll help you any way I can. AJ had always been a fiercely loyal friend, and Kelly appreciated that now more than ever. She sent her text to Alice, who responded instantly with, Of course, I'll be there at two. And she sighed as she leaned back into the couch. I haven't heard a word about Shad Webb, AJ said. Do you feel like talking about him? Kelly grinned, and she glanced at her best friend. Sure, I can talk about him. Chapter 26 Alice looked up as her doorbell rang. It took a moment for her mind to leave the document she'd been studying, and then a few more for her to wonder who could possibly be stopping by in the middle of the day. Her stomach growled as she got to her feet, and she glanced at the top of her monitor where the clock sat. Just after noon. No wonder she was hungry. Alice wasn't a big breakfast eater, though she did enjoy coffee. Sometimes she had a fruit cup with it, but more often than not, she counted the cream and sugar as her treat for the day. Someone knocked, and Alice got out of her desk chair. Coming, she called. Maybe she had a package she had to sign for. She stepped out of the office, rounded the corner, and reached for the doorknob. She pulled open the door, expecting to see a delivery man, and falling back a step when she found Arthur standing there. A grin formed on his face as his eyes traveled up the height of her body to her face. Do you have time for lunch? He held up a plastic bag that had a suspicious-looking lobster on it. Alice grinned back at him, her heartbeat cartwheeling through her chest. Is that a lobster roll from Tradewinds? Perhaps, he said, stepping forward and into the house. Alice didn't move an inch which meant he now stood in her personal space. He leaned toward her, inhaled, and said, It's good to see you. She tilted her head slightly, and that was all the encouragement Arthur needed. He kissed her, his mouth aligning perfectly with hers. The man had some experience with women because he could kiss Alice and make her weak in the knees on the first stroke. She reached up and threaded her fingers through his hair and stood right there in her open doorway to return his kiss. He pulled away with a chuckle. I have to be back in 30 minutes. Maybe you could come back tonight for dinner, too, she said. You never did answer my text. She closed the door as he walked further into her house. I had a meeting, he said. Office or kitchen? Let's go in the kitchen she said, following him as he started that way. I don't like eating where I work. Then I feel like I never get a break. Smart, he said. How long do you get for lunch over there? She asked. Forty minutes. And you have thirty left? I called in the order. He put the bag on the table and started unpacking it. With two clear plastic containers on the table, and Alice grabbing a couple of forks from her utensil drawer, they sat down to eat. Alice thought of when she'd snuck off campus as a teenager. It had never been to eat with her boyfriend, but to make out with him. She looked away from Arthur and at her lobster roll, something she'd mentioned to him on their first date. I didn't know trade winds delivered, she said. Everywhere delivers now, Alice. If the restaurant doesn't, food share will. Oh, do you like food share? I haven't tried it. I pretty much eat exclusively food that someone else brings me. He laughed and opened his plastic container, too. He'd ordered the fish tacos and crab salad, and he forked up a bite of the latter. 
It's just a rideshare driver picking up and delivering food, he said. You can order from almost anywhere now. Interesting, Alice said. I'll have to try it. The twins' eating habits would change dramatically if she started letting them use food share. Charlie had asked about it a while ago, but Alice had said no and ordered pizza. Ginny cooks sometimes, Alice said. Some nights are cold cereal or pancakes. She didn't want to admit that she couldn't afford to feed herself and her kids at a restaurant, fast casual or not, seven days a week. But she couldn't. She didn't think most people could. Her first bite of the lobster roll reminded her why she loved trade winds, and she groaned with the creamy lobster meat and the tart, mustardy sauce that set their rolls above the others. Arthur smiled at her and picked up one of his tacos. I hope I didn't interrupt. You can always interrupt if you're bringing me lunch, she said with a smile. Or even if you're not. She was comfortable with him, and Alice sure did like that. She liked that they talked about grown-up things, situations and experiences they were having right now, and didn't have any past to reminisce about. She'd like that with Will, too, but when it came time to be 45 instead of 15, there'd been very little there. Anything exciting going on at the high school? She asked him. Actually, he said, I'm getting an award. Alice's eyes widened at the same rate her joy did. Arthur, that's fantastic, she said. She got to her feet and stepped over to him to give him a hug. The angle was awkward, and Arthur reached up to put his arms around her. He sort of patted, and foolishness filled Alice, causing her to step away quickly. Oh, okay, he said, chuckling as she retook her seat. I should get an award every day. She laughed, too, hoping to cover the awkwardness with the sound of her voice. What was the award for? She asked. I'm getting counselor of the year, he said. His smile twinged with pride. Arthur, that's amazing, really. Thank you. He ducked his head and focused on his food. Alice finished her roll, too, and then stood to put their containers in the recycling bin. She turned to find Arthur standing right behind her. He took her into his arms and kissed her again, this time with more passion than when they'd stood out in the open for anyone to see. His fingers tangled in her hair, and he broke the kiss only to move his mouth to her earlobe. Arthur, she gasped as he pressed her into the kitchen cabinets next to the garbage can. Her foot caught against it, causing it to slide. Arthur didn't seem to care, and Alice didn't either. Everything inside her fired now, his hands sliding down the sides of her neck to her shoulders. He stood right in front of her, giving her no room to move, but Alice didn't mind at all. She didn't want to move even an inch. She reached up and ran her hand through her hair, leaning her head back to give him better access to her neck. The twins won't be home for a while, right? He asked. No, Alice gasped, but she wanted to know why he'd asked. Don't you have to get back to work? I can stay, he said, reclaiming her mouth. Alice lost herself in his touch, and it had been such a long time since Alice had felt this strongly about a man. Even Will didn't ignite her the way Arthur did. I want you he said, circling her nipples with his thumbs. Do you have time? He was really asking if she'd sleep with him. And while Alice wasn't sure how much time had passed since he'd shown up on the front stoop with lunch, it couldn't have been more than 20 minutes. I have time, she said, pushing against his chest gently. She met his eye, the desire and hope in his plain to see. Is it too early? You tell me, he said, placing one hand flat against the cupboard next to her head. Who's the last woman you went out with? She asked. Serena Fletcher, he said. She's a few years younger than me, and I met her at a singles karaoke night. Wow, Alice said, 
sliding her hand down the front of his dress shirt. Her fingers paused when they touched the top of his belt. He put his other hand against the cabinet on the other side of her head, as if bracing himself to stand there, Alice contained in the space between his arms. How long ago was that? She whispered. A year or so ago, he said, pulling in a breath. Did you sleep with her? Alice asked, arching her back and pressing her chest against his in the small amount of space they had. No, he said. She was interesting, and I liked her. We were more like friends. In fact, we're still friends. You don't want to be my friend? Alice asked. I want to be your friend, he said. I want to be your lover. You turn me on in a way no woman has in a long time. You're beautiful and interesting. I love spending time with you, and I love talking to you. Did you bring me a lobster roll from Tradewind so you could sleep with me? He looked like she'd slapped him across the face, and that was all the answer Alice needed. She matched her mouth to his and pressed on his chest to get him to back up. Then she tugged on his tie and led him to her bedroom. Alice collected her papers and grabbed her purse. She reminded herself that she could be a few minutes late to meet with AJ and Kelly because it was, well, AJ and Kelly. Neither of them were paying her, and she'd so been enjoying her conversation with Arthur, and she hated to cut things short with him. He'd left only ten minutes ago, when she should have been in a car on her way to AJ's. She'd still been in bed, and she'd watched him get redressed in the dim light, blissfully happy happier than she'd been in a long, long time. Game face, she muttered to herself. Channel your inner Kelly. She didn't want to tell anyone that she'd slept with Arthur only a week after meeting him, after two dates. Great dates, sure. Lots of texting, yes. A few phone conversations, of course. She supposed the lunch they'd just shared could be considered date number three, but Alice still felt like she'd accelerated things in her love life too fast. As she tapped to request a rideshare, a flush of heat overcame her, very much the way it had when they'd made love. Alice smiled to herself, because Arthur was a far better lover than Frank. She'd laid in Arthur's arms, and they'd talked about her love of the law, how much she wanted her children to be happy and healthy and free from harm. He'd told her about his first wife and why they'd broken up. He'd told her what had brought him to Five Island Cove and why he'd stayed. Only when her alarm went off, reminding her of her meeting with Kelly, did she realize how much time had passed. She strode down the sidewalk toward the rideshare, thinking of Arthur's final kiss goodbye. Pick you up at six? He'd asked. I can come at five, too. Let's do five, she'd said. Charlie had to work until six, and Ginny would be scooping ice cream until ten. Her mind whirred, and she thought perhaps they could make love in her bed again the moment he arrived, then go to dinner and have another romp at his house before the night ended. She shook her head in disbelief. She wasn't sure if she wanted to set that precedent, but then she remembered the way he'd... Ma'am? The driver asked, and Alice looked up. Heat filled her face, as if the 20-something would know what she'd been thinking about. Where to? Sorry, she said, quickly rattling off AJ's address. Game face, she told herself again. She couldn't be thinking about Arthur's body and how hers had reacted to his while with a client. She shouldn't for her best friends, either. At least, not if she wanted to keep their private activities private, which she did. She sent a group text to Charlie and Ginny, telling them about her date and that she'd be home before 11. They both responded before she arrived at AJ's, and Alice paid the driver and got out of the car, just as a text from Arthur came in. Your place or mine tonight? 
A grin exploded across her face, especially at the next text. I'm erasing all of these texts as soon as I send them. Well, at least this one. That was the best afternoon I've had in my life. I hope you enjoyed it too. She giggled, her thumbs flying across her screen. You better erase that. What if one of your students sees it? You erase them too, he said. Deal, she sent to him. And the answer to your question is both. She hoped that would be enough to let him know that she'd had an amazing afternoon with him and that she could scarcely wait three more hours to be with him again. The front door opened, and Kelly came to the top of the steps. Gotta go, she said. No more texts. I'm with my friends. Deal, Arthur said. To everything you said. Alice deleted the entire thread, though she wished she could read the part about how that afternoon with her had been the best one of his life, time and time again. Alice had never felt very desired by Frank. If she was so fantastic, why did he chase other women? Why did he sleep with them? Why didn't he come home during the week? For a long time, Alice had believed he simply had a sexual appetite she couldn't satisfy. When he did come home on the weekends, they'd make love three and four times, and it was never enough. After a while, Alice simply felt used. And when she'd told Frank that, he'd said he needed the release. At that point, she knew he'd been sleeping around on her, probably extensively in the city, and she hadn't let him touch her again. It had felt so nice to be touched again and touched by a man that obviously adored her and craved only her. Are you coming in? Kelly called. And Alice once again pulled herself out of her thoughts. Yes, she said, tucking her phone into her purse and striding down the driveway. <laughs>